All right, you guys ready? All right. Welcome to your last team meeting of 2021. I don't know about the rest of you, uh, but when somebody tells me that the pandemic has been going on for what, like three years now, it blows my mind. And uh, what we have for you today and what you will see if you were on Zoom uh, is the new format that we are hoping to follow as we move into next year. And so if some companies are presenting themselves as completely digital landscapes, what we know is true is that you guys are an agent body who uh, really values your freedom and where you can show up. So it's not a question of only this being a resource, but a yes and. And so if you were on Zoom today, what you were going to miss out is on some unique interactions that you could have with Scott Federici and Stephanie Welter. If you are on Zoom, you're going to see some content from the one and only Rich Tepper and the world famous Don Bremer. You're going to see a lot of marketing content from people that you already know that are here in the office that you see all the time, like Holly No Shop. And so without further ado, uh, we're going to move through some announcements that we have from your leadership staff, uh, and then we're going to get on to the content. And I've had a chance to preview uh, some of what's going to be said today, and you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, and if, you, if you're wondering if you should have done the pop by workshop, I think after you see the content from today and some videos that we're going to take, uh, we're likely to see you in person next time. So without further ado, let's bring up Karen. What do we got? Hey, how's everybody doing? You guys have had a fantastic year. And I, it's not quite over. We got 15 days still for the end of the month, end of the month, and the end of the year. If you have closings scheduled, between now and the end of the year, please double check command. Make sure you've got all of your compliance done. Make sure you've got your commission tab submitted because it's going to be busy the last couple of weeks and we want to make sure everybody gets paid and their production counted for the end of the year. So if you can please do that, I'd appreciate it. And have a happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, and happy holidays. And we will see you all as we pass in the hallway. See you next year. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Karen. All right. Thank you, Baker. Hello, hello. Hey. <laughs> My dearest family, it's always wonderful to see you. Um, the last contract class of the year will be held on the 20th of December. Um, that is a Monday from 10 to 2. So if you're new or you want a, a fresh up, I always welcome you. Um, just a, a little clarification on CE. Um, I know our staff gets a lot of calls on CE. If you were licensed prior to November 2nd, 2019, you need the 12 hours plus one hour of sexual harassment. Um, if you were licensed between November 2nd and Oct uh, November 2nd, 2019, and October 31st of this year, you will need the 45 hour broker post license uh, class. Um, as far as brand new agents, if you were licensed on or after November 1st of 2021, your license renewal is actually April 30th, 2024, not next year. So sometime before that renewal in 2024, you will then have to take a 45 hour broker post license class plus one hour of sexual harassment. And last, don't forget to send your certificates of completion for the mandatory ethics class that I will not bother you about anymore this year. So who are we sending them to? To your Asking board. For a friend. Mm -hmm. To your board. <laughs> we do not maintain those records in our office. So, okay. Yep. That is it. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Here's some authenticity for you. I read those announcements and I still have to do mine. <laughs> right? Yep. I'm getting a nod. Yeah. All right. Kali No Shop, let's cook it. All right. So, I have two things. If you're on the LC meeting, it's a repeat of what I said before. Um, I have the marketing menu out, and so it's in the round table to take a look at it. Um, it's essentially all the templates that I've already built for just listed, just sold, all those things. Um, also added some new client testimonial graphics. Um, so I know I've been pushing you to get reviews on Google. Well, we can also post them to your social media in an aesthetically pleasing way. So you can use those. Just send me literally the text of your review. I can make those. 
So that's the first thing. And then I have my niche marketing class today as part of this whole shindig and event. So I really hope you guys will join because I think that'll really help um, propel you, especially if you are planning on using social media as a key part of your marketing next year. Um, it'll definitely help protect you and get some better engagement. Awesome. Looking forward to that's it. That's it. Am I the only one that pronounces like I use niche and niche in the same? Are they the same? Yeah, they're the same. Okay. I use both. I okay. Niche, niche, sounds niche sounds fancy. Niche sounds fancy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's an extension. If you guys are wondering of going small to go big, right? What you can't do, Colleen's not in her head in the other room. What you can't do is project the same message to everybody, right? Anyway, awesome. Looking forward to it. Lisa Tills. What's going on? What's Hi, going everyone. On? Uh, happy almost Christmas and happy new year almost. Um, gosh, 2021, what a big year. It's probably been very big for everyone sitting here right now. Um, it's been really big for me, but it's not over. So first year here, Haley's like, Lise, I'm telling you this Christmas time, it's going to die down. And I'm like, all right. So I'm doing my planning and it's not dying down. So I'm not happy about that, but I'm so happy about that, right? Because that means that you guys are so dedicated. Your commitment is ridiculous. Your energy is contagious, and we appreciate it so much. But we do have um, we do have a week left. So if you feel after this message that you are not the ones that are motivated and committed in this month, you still have a week to do that. So please um, book some time with us, and. Um, and let's just clean up and, and clear out your to-do list and the people that you need to reach out to and make that important and finish the year really strong. Um, speaking of strong, Mary Kirkpatrick, we wanna do a shout out to you on your first closing. And Dustin, we're so proud of you for your um, listing that uh, you took this week. So we're so proud of you and everyone in the coaching program and Haley and I are here. If you need anything before the year ends um, and if you're not part of coaching and you're thinking that 2020 Two is the year for that. Come talk to us. We would love to uh, love to see everyone. Have a great holiday. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Here's what we know about the people that get into coaching. We know that statistically they become more productive faster, right? And this then continues because momentum is something that we build up over time. Um, all right. Really quickly, want to update everybody a few things. Uh, we have our culture keeper of the month. And uh, Scott, am I correct in saying this? This person has never been recognized. That's my understanding. This is this is mind blowing to me. Um, there is somebody that exists in our world who will literally drag the transactions over the finish line, and she is immersed uh, in the day to day activities of, of some of our top people. And so this month's uh, winner is Kim Elks. Kim Elks, congratulations. I also want to update everybody on some of the effort that you're going to see from this office. We all know that there was a tragedy that occurred. There was a large tornado and many of our fellow KW agents were affected. Uh, be on the lookout in Roundtable for how your office is showing up and how you can show up as we support all of those uh, that were affected by the recent tornado disaster. Uh, what you guys might not understand is the scale of that is that there are literally market centers that are missing. And so while you might think that this is just uh, something that well, not to minimize it, but it's not just something that happened, but this will affect their business for a very long time because the homes that they would have sold to make money for themselves, those are gone too. So be on the lookout for round table as we show up to support our fellow KW uh, person. So as far as today's schedule, what can you expect? Uh, I'm going to bring Dawn Bremer up here in just a moment. We're going to get started a little bit earlier than we thought we would with her. Uh, she's going to authentically share with you how she uh, is a titan of business with her listing effort that she applies when she's brought into listing appointments. You're going to see the one and only Rich Tepper as well, share some ideas around lead generation. Uh, for those of you that are here in person, you'll have an opportunity to engage with Scott Fed in his follow-up and then goal planning with Stephanie Welter. And then of course, uh, the pop buy workshop where we cut the cost of what it takes for you to produce pop buys uh, because of the scale of our economy. So Don Brummer, can I get you to come up? Can we just get started and uh, start talking about uh, what is probably the most authentic way that I think somebody does a listing presentation? You want to sit, stand? What do you want to do? Whatever you want. Yeah? Sure. I'm going to get some chairs. Okay. Let's do that. And then Hi. so everybody knows, uh, Dawn has some stuff we're going to talk about. And then I know that we get a lot of value out of Q&A. Well, Dawn, I appreciate you being here. Thanks for asking me. Yeah. I um so is there anybody in the, you can't hear? What if we talk like this? 
<laughs> you got that voice? I can talk like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, here's what we know to be true. We know that there, uh, there are other sources for information, but what you guys are consistently asking for is the ability to interact with titans of business. And so while some companies present a completely digital landscape and hang marketing uh, platforms in front of you, we know that you really, uh, what you literally want is one-to-one -one interaction with people that are moving large volumes of property. And so here we are. So what are we talking about today? We're going to talk about a listings and what you can do in a listing to seal the listing. That's right. And um, people always say, you know, what do you do differently than other people? And it's, I think it's literally, I do nothing like anybody else. Because, um, you know, we were talking in my office yesterday and one of my agents, Dan, was saying how I walk in and I bring nothing with me. And it's true. I do bring well, it's not true. I do bring a piece of paper with their information on it. But other than that, I do not bring anything with me for my first appointment because I just want to go have a conversation. That's what I'm doing. I want to go have a conversation with somebody who's looking for answers. They're not necessarily wanting to sign a listing agreement right there. They necessarily want to know what it takes to sell their house and get it ready. And so that's a little different than what I do, which I think relieves that pressure of trying to walk away with the listing. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. You know, and when I was in your office yesterday, we were we were joking around how you walk into a room and like what you actually say. Yes. Right. And what's interesting because I'm still uh, even though I've been in real estate for the amount of time that I've been in, I remember my very first listing presentation and I over inundated the people with data. Right. Right. So it's not just a this or that. It's a this, that, somewhere in between. But then really leaning into who you are yes. and, and how you portray yourself to these folks. Right. I don't really talk about in my listing appointment what I'm going to do to sell their house. I'm really asking them what they want me to do to sell their house. Right. What are they looking for? Why are they selling? So basically, when I go into an appointment, the first thing I do is say, why am I here? Where are you going? What are you doing? Is it a job transfer? Is it a divorce? Is it uh, we want to upgrade? Is it we are having babies? And what is it? Because you really have to understand what it is that they're looking for so that you can do that job correctly. And I think that's a lot of things that people forget. And let's be honest, everybody wants to talk about their house and everybody wants to talk about their life. So it's true. And when you get to know them about it, they feel that connection to you which maybe can separate you from a listing where it's just inundated with, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I do things. They feel that connection to you because you know what their kids' names are. You know where they're going. You know what they're doing. And so that's one of the biggest things I think that we do differently at our team. Can we quickly talk about how you might prepare for a listing appointment? And I just want to touch on what you just said, which uh, when we are consistently moving, so, so the, the process of selling a home is indeed a process with bumps and valleys mm -hmm. and all that. And I think what we find most often where you're sourcing out why they're selling, that why, like we have a big why here and why we run our business, but these folks, this is their single largest asset that they've spent the most money on in their entire lives. And so the decision to move is something that I think we need to highlight over and over again uh, as we have a valley is we have a high, right? And Correct. So sometimes where I see a lot of you show up in that conversation is, uh, well, let's get you to Colorado. Let's get you to this. Let's move you here. Well, we got to think of, you're telling me a story about somebody who was selling their property uh, for their kids mm -hmm. yesterday, right? Yeah. Well, let's get that funding for your kids because that's the language they speak. Correct. They want, once you understand their why, just like we understand our why, when yeah. we know what our why is, we know how to do it. So if you know what their why is, you know what they're needing from you to accomplish that why. That's right. And that's what, it's just different. It's, it's not about going there and telling them, this is how I'm going to sell. This is the process. It's, this is what I'm going to do to get you to that goal. Do you want a bigger house? Well, then we want to talk about this. If you want to move, well, let me talk to you about my preferred partners in different states. And then you have more information to give them. And you are, I, I call it weaponry. You have the weapons to help them fight that battle of whatever it is. Right. Right. Can we dive into the process that you take before you go take a listing? Now, I know that you've surrounded yourself with an army of, of straight up killers, right? Yeah. That, that help you with fundamental things, some small stuff that's a big thing, that lead to a bigger effort. 
But if you could bullet point for us, what are some things you do to prepare before you walk in that door? Well, it's kind of weird and people think I'm crazy. I don't even look at the house before I um, go to it because I think you go with preconceived um, notions. I don't want to know if they've upgraded already. I don't want to know that. So when we have a listing, I pull um, a previous MLS sheet, the last sale one that they have, um, whether they bought it or um, it was listed once before and they couldn't sell it. Because you want to know that, like, oh, you tried to sell this three years ago. What happened? So that's important. Um, I always pull the tax records and I always pull the um, assessor's records. So we have the actual square footage because, you know, it's never right in the MLS. <laughs> so the assessor records, you want to know the actual lot square footage. I can't tell you how many times I go on an appointment and they say I have one and a half acres and they have three quarters of an acre. That makes a huge difference. So you want to know those things. And I just put that in a manila folder and that's it. And I do, we do have a listing packet that is bound. Um, this office took care of it and made a beautiful thing with Jennifer Beltrami's uh, brilliant design. And, but I never go over it. I just give that to them as a parting gift. Here you go, look at it and we'll talk again. Stop laughing, Jen. Um, but so those are the only items I bring. And I bring my folder and that's where I take the notes. So when I go to the listing, the biggest thing that I think that a lot of listing agents make the mistake is, is you just walk in and you go right to the front door. I don't. I get there about 10 minutes early and I do the exterior. I want to know if there's peeling paint and the window sills. I want to know if there's peeling paint and the garage trim. I want to know if the back of the house needs to be power washed because it's got that moss. You want to know all that stuff. And then when you walk into their house, they're impressed that you've already taken all these notes on the first outside and you know about it. So that's, I think, really, really a thing that sets us apart is definitely do the exterior walk, know how close the park is, drive the neighborhood, see what the neighborhood is actually called, um, see how many houses are in that neighborhood. So I go early, um, outside 10 minutes, and usually about a half hour early to drive around the neighborhood. That's the first thing we do. And then when we uh, go in, we say hi, and I go right to, if we don't mind, can we look at the house before we talk? And I always say, I'm going to walk your house as a buyer. That's really important, guys. Walk the house as a buyer, because that's who's going to be looking at the house. So when you have a buyer, how do they walk in your house? They look up, they look down, they look to the left, they look to the right, they open drawers, they open closets, they turn on lights, do all that. It makes a huge difference. They love that you're walking through the house as a buyer. And it also changes your perception, in my opinion. You may not tell somebody that they have to paint a green wall because I'm going to buy the house whether it's got a green wall or not. But you may tell somebody to clean the vents in the ceiling, the returns, or removing the bugs from the closet lights that have been pooling in that are black and gross. So those just little things, they notice that you pick up and that makes a big difference. So walk through the house as a buyer. Biggest, biggest advice that I was ever given. How do you serve that up, right? Because I know for, for some folks, when I've, I've been on listing presentations, have you thought about cleaning this? Like, it, it, how do you imply that some stuff has to happen without insulting the seller? I probably insult a lot of sellers. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Stop batting, Jennifer. Um, I probably do. Because I, I say, listen, you know, I want you to understand that things that I'm going to say to you, you may get insulted by, but I'm being an honest person. I want you to understand that seeing pooling of bugs in your closet or your vents in your bathroom that have all that dust and stuff is going to give somebody the appearance that you're not properly taking care of your house, although we know you are. But it's all about perception. So we want people to understand that there is no dust in those vents. There are no bugs because you meticulously maintain this house. And that makes them feel more comfortable about buying a used house. Yeah. And I use it as the same example as if you wouldn't go look at a used car dealership with breadcrumbs and food all over a seat cushion. Nobody's going to want to look at a house. I mean, a, a car that has French fries stuffed in the cushions. <laughs> you don't want French fries stuffed in your couch. Same concept. With the, um, so you're pulling, let's just quickly bullet point what you're, what you're bringing to the listing presentation. Manila folder, mm -hmm. right, that you can write on. Correct. Right, as a lot of us are told that you need shiny objects. No, to, mine to, is to literally like a penny folder. Yeah, this is what I find most fascinating about people at your level. So one thing that I'm afforded in this role is to sit back and watch. 
right? And a common denominator is that the titans of our industry are using very simple tools. Yeah. Very simple. When the rest of us are brought into this world, like, give me all the shiny stuff. Right. Well, right? I used to have shiny folders yeah. that had my name on them, and they were worthless. Yeah. So, and the manila folder then has all of the stuff on the outside of it to give to my administrative assistant so that she can then take all of my notes and put them in a description. She knows what the flooring is in each room. She doesn't have to ask me any of it because I literally am going through and writing it. And sometimes there's so much to write that I write on the inside and the outside and whatever. And then on the back of the folder, I always put the recommended repairs or corrections that the homeowner has to do so that the admin can then write that in a summary email to them, whether they list with us or not. We want to share with them what they need to do in our opinion. And is the MLS sheet inside of that folder? Yeah. Okay. And so what were you hoping to accomplish from the MLS uh, sheet? Are you, are you pulling previous sales that that house might have incurred? No, I don't ever look at that at that point. Okay. But what I do have is, so it tells you that it's got hardwood floors in it. Well, does it still have hardwood floors in it or does it have carpeting now? So I just make that change to a C to an H so that when we're doing the data entry, again, she has all that information. Maybe they don't have a loft anymore. Maybe it's a fourth bedroom. Yeah. So you want to make those changes. Because the worst thing you could do is give it to an admin who's never seen that house and then put the listing in with a loft that is no longer a loft. Right, right, right. And so are you doing any, or what would you say to somebody that uh, thinks they need to research the sales around that home? Prior to going to a Prior listing? Prior to showing up. I, I, I don't understand why anybody would do that. This The concept is, is how many times have you gone to a listing that maybe somebody else has already gone to? And they say, well, I had a previous person who came here yesterday and told me my house was worth 240. Right. I, I always say, well, how could they possibly know that they don't know what you did with the house? I have no clue what your house looks like. You bought your house in 1985. Did you do nothing since 1985? Well, then that's one price. But in 1985, if, if last year you upgraded it with new windows, roof, the siding and gutters, well, I have to see how that compares to everybody else. So I think it's a shame if anybody comes. I think you're going to set yourself up to lose that listing if you come with the CMA and say, I pulled comps and this is what your house is going to go for. Because I would say to somebody, well, how could you possibly know that? You've never seen my house. How does that compare to the house that you just pulled a comp for? Right. So that's never to that in my opinion. So Don, I may be jumping ahead here, but when you go there, what is your like go-to script when they say, what should we list the house for? I always say to them, so what I'm going to do the, before we even get to that, I when I walk in, I say, I'm first going to look at your house and we're going to go through everything, in my opinion, that needs to be done to get it ready and things that you may have to do to get it ready. And then tomorrow, or maybe later today, if I have time, I'll give you a call and we'll go over what the house's value is based on the comps that I pulled. I never put it in writing. I know that sounds crazy, but people are like, why don't you put it in writing? Because it could fluctuate. I could give them something in writing that says that your house should be listed at 275 September. Now you call me in January, the market's changed and you want me to list your house for 275. Nah, not gonna happen. And I always give a range. So I'll say, I think we could list your house someplace between 275 and 290. So it'll all depend when you're ready and what you're willing to do to make it to that. It makes a huge difference. Can I throw you like a weird curveball? Come on. Um, so, <laughs> You get a phone call. Your office gets a phone call. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about selling my home. Mm -hmm. What do you charge? Well, it's funny because I'll tell you the truth. We don't really talk about commission very often at all in our office. Um, we just put it on the contract and they usually accept it. But what I always say to somebody who will call me and say, you know, I want to list your house. I want to list my house. What is your fee? I will say, we'll discuss our fee when we have an interview. Just like when I went on an interview, you're not going to ask me over the phone what I want. We're going to talk about it at a meeting. So I never, ever, ever talk about your commission on over the, the, on a, over the phone, exactly. ever. Okay. Um, what about, and if you guys have any questions, this is interactive. Like yeah. Just raise your hand Please. and ask away. Um, what about, uh, we are currently interviewing other agents. What makes you different? I would say I encourage you to interview other agents because you will see that our services far outweigh anybody's in the industry. Because what you'll have from us is us. You will get us. You will not get somebody who's just going to list your house. We are here from the beginning and end because education is your power and we want to be the ones to educate you. So, so I was out to lunch with you yesterday. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of people in this room know how heavily involved you are in the community. But uh, because of something we've previously done with you, but for the first time listeners here, can you uh, 
And what I'm getting at is how are you afforded the, uh, what I'll call authority to walk into this person's home uh, with just a manila folder, right? Tell them what's wrong with it and be as authentic as possible. It's because of stuff that you've done. Well, I mean, I think that it's, first of all, I, I think it's, um, I, if you know me, I am, have very little confidence in a lot of things in my life, but I'm very confident in my listing ability. If you ask me how I am as a buyer's agent, I would fire me. I'm a terrible buyer's agent. So I think that it's confidence, first of all. That's, uh, I love what I do. It's almost to me like crap um, or like a lottery um, you know, a slot machine, pulling the slot machine and getting all sevens when I walk away from a listing, that's my excitement. So that's a little weird. And I don't know that a lot of people have that weirdness. But um, I think what you're alluding to is my community service. And so what um, I have been afforded is having a phenomenal team that allows me to be out in the community. And so I volunteer quite a bit. Um, I'm an elected official. I'm the president of a school board in my community. I'm commissioner of planning and zoning for the city that I'm in. Um, I am the president of the chamber group that I network at. I am the president of two non-for-profits, which is not, not for the business, but because I grew up in community service and that's something that's so important to me. However, that allows me to have people know me and I think when you're commissioner of planning and zoning and you're going into a listing, it gives you some cre credibility that you know what's going on in the community, which really, I think, helps solidify what you were trying to allude right, to. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, Haley, what you got? Well, like, if, if we were to, it's 1030, so we got to move on to the next one. But if we were going to close this out with, what would you say to, to a brand new agent, seasoned agent who wants to master their listing appointment this year? What would be your advice to them? Be authentic to who you are and walk in there like nobody in this community is going to be a better listing agent than you. And then live up to that. And the more that you live up to that, the more referrals you'll get. Talk to those people that are listing your house, not just when you get the listing, but even after the listing. Communicate with them. You listen to them. Hear them say, um, maybe you're in a listing appointment and they're looking for a daycare person at their new place. Great. Well, I have somebody in that community who has somebody in daycare. I can connect you. Now you become more to them than just a listing appointment. You're a listener. That's what's really what I would say. We have a little bit more time because we started early. Yeah, that it's all good. Uh, you had a question. Purple shirt. Purple question. Um, yeah, you only do a few steps? Yeah. And is the second step over the phone or in person? Always over the phone unless they ask for me to come back. I see. And then at that point, you're emailing with the contract? Oh, yeah. So the, we'll do a DocuSign for a contract. Now, there are some times that I will go back for a second appointment if there's a lot to do. What I'll say is, hey, if you want to go forward with the listing, we can talk about maybe coming back next Friday. I can bring the listing and let's see where the progress is. So sometimes I do come back just to double check their work. Obviously, you have no problem getting a closing phone bill. It's obviously working. Yeah, <laughs> luckily. I mean, I think that if it, um, again, I really want to stress, just have confidence. If you're in this, you have the confidence that you can sell their house. Just show it to them. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, okay. I'll get to everybody. Uh, quick question. On your packet that you leave behind, what's the feedback that you got from that? Do you ever get like, because you were saying Jennifer made it? Yeah, I'm not even sure if they open it. It oh, okay. has, um, it's a bound book that you, they did here for us. And it has a bunch of like the Keller Williams marketing stuff, okay. I believe. And then at the back end, it has who we are. And we, um, we use the 360 Home Connect. Do you guys all know about that? Yeah. So if you don't know about that, learn about that because that's phenomenal. It's um, a company that changes utilities for people. Yeah. So that's yeah. in there and that's real important. And I think that's always been a great closer for us. So we leave that at the end. Yeah, that is nice because people do ask like, who the hell is this person calling me? So Correct. Yeah. And it's really Makes good sense. to have that information yeah. in there. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Go on. Uh, as far as like the listing um, papers, like going over the property disclosure and the radon agency, where does that fit in? Is that appointment number one or on the phone? So that would be number two, actually, and my admin does that. Okay, and if you're admin free, you just would So if you have an admin second. free, that either you'd go back for a second or do it on the phone. Uh, okay. Absolutely. 
Do you guys know what the two-step process is? Except for the first time I heard it, I understand. Right. I'd like to hear like a yes. Like we break that down, right? Because I, what I can tell you is, uh, when we come into contact with people that are newly licensed, they uh, they look at the licensing. Or I'm sorry, the listing process is a one shot. This is your first interview. This is the only thing, uh, your only opportunity to get this listing. Right. But the two step process is not that. No. And and I'll and actually I'm pretty sure if I'm not mistaken that I learned the two step program from Tyler. Um, years and years ago when I was at the Libertyville office, he did a round table um, for us and I was blown away by the thought process because I too was doing, I would come to the appointment and be like, okay, so you want to sign? Right. And let's be honest, I don't know that many people, um, I, when I go to go look for a car, I'm not buying that car in the first five minutes of being there and I'm certainly not doing it by the end. I hate a pesty salesperson and if they annoy me, I'm out. So I kind of feel like that's how a listing appointment could be if you're expecting to leave from a listing appointment. I mean, this is the biggest financial decision of their life. They need a minute, they need to break. So that was what I really learned from um, when I learned about it. So it's kind of like giving them a break to digest it. I always say, hey, you should interview other agents. There are different people who have different um, assets. Maybe you'll find somebody that fits better with you. But this, the two-step appointment is to show them a little bit about who you are, what you offer. But in my opinion, it's wanting them to want you more, Leave, wanting to talk to you, wanting to have you call them. You know, one of the things that I learned in Bold, which was really funny, and I remember being a new agent thinking, they're nuts, when uh, the coach said, um, you leave there and you say, okay, well, you know, I'll be in touch with you, and you think about if you want to work with me, and I'll think about if I want to work with you. And I was like, who the hell is going to say, I want to, if I want to work with you, but it's really the truth because Jennifer will, I'll go to an appointment and I'll be like, those people were nuts. They are crazy. They were a lunatic. And she'll be like, don't take the listing. Then of course I'll take the listing. And then she'll be like, I don't want to hear it. I told you, you knew that they were nuts. Why did you take the listing? Why did we take the listing? I don't know, but that's the kind of concept. So you want to make sure that they want to talk to you again. They want to have it, and you want to know whether you really do want to list with them. Are you introducing the two-step, or are you let, lending it to almost let them conduct if it's going to be a two-step or not? Well, that's a really great question. I, I think it's a little bit of both, because when I leave, I'll say, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the office. I'm going to put into my system what you have, what you've done, how, what the houses in the area are going for, how you compare it to the houses in the area, and then I'll give you a call. And if it's something you want to move forward with or have additional questions, we can talk then. In the meantime, if you come up with additional questions, please email me so that I have those answers for you before the end of the conversation. So I think it's like, well, if they email me and they want to engage, then we, I know where I fit with them kind of concept. So, and it's funny, I'll always say, I'll call you tomorrow. And then I'll maybe send them a text at like 10 and say, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I'll call you this afternoon. I want them to know that I'm not waiting to be like, can you list with me? Can you list with me? And by the time I call, they're like, oh, we've been waiting for you to call all day. It's very interesting. When you, it's almost like, what do they say when you, when it, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're connecting on the phone call, um, obviously we're only talking to one of the parties, right? How does that work in terms of who you're calling and coordinating that and making Another great question. I always ask if they can call me when they're together, because I definitely don't want to have a conversation with him and then to have to call her. So when I say, hey, can I give you guys a call tomorrow at four? Will you both be available? Can we do a conference call? So I normally have them both at the same time. But quite honestly, it's interesting. Most of the time, the husband will say, well, she's going to be making the decision. So just talk to her. So <laughs> it's very true. The psychology behind that. Yeah. So a few different things. This goes down to the colors that certain brands use. Really? Knowing that the female in the relationship will make the decision. That's interesting. Yeah. It's pretty fascinating. And as far as the two-step process goes, in case you guys are wondering, they want what they can't have. Correct. And if you break this down into a human interaction, it's, hey, Don, my name is Dan. You want to get married? Right. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Hell no. right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I wouldn't either. But it's seriously the, it's the truth, though. It, yeah. it really is. And it's somehow like if you seem like you're available and you need their listing, they're not going to list with you. But when they see that you're in high demand and you are busy and that people want you, 
you know, also the same thing is I don't, if somebody calls me for a listing appointment and they say, can you come tomorrow? Most of the time I say, no, no, I can't come tomorrow. I have appointments in the morning and then I have something in the afternoon, but I could go Thursday at two. Well, we really wanted to get the house listed by Friday. I understand, but I can't come before Thursday at two. They won't be Thursday at two. They won't, but they can't have They're Correct. And uh, I think it's Kathy Ruffles. You have to play your own game. Yep. You're not playing anybody else's game. Correct. And as soon as you start playing somebody else's game, you're going to play by their rules. Correct. And the minute that you start letting them control when you're going to call them and when they're going to talk to you, then you've lost the control of the deal. Now you become their beck and call person. And none of us have time to be somebody's beck and call person. Yeah. Great stuff. Other questions, guys? Literally ask anything you want. Lisa. This is more of a comment or an observation, but would you think that the educational piece of, of that is gaining the control by letting them know this is what I'm going to do for you versus even giving them the floor to let them guide you? A hundred percent. The number one thing you have to do is tell them all of the things that are going to go wrong in their listing, for sure. Let them know that people, especially in the winter, you know, you will get you booties, but people are going to trace mud and snow through your house. Please just understand. We'll do the best that we can. Have a towel by the door. Um, you know, people are going to leave lights on. Always tell people that when you list their house, somebody's going to leave your house unlocked. Somebody may go home with the key. We'll figure it out. We'll make sure your house is secured soon. We'll make sure we get you a new key. Because when you tell them all of the things that are going to go wrong, they're less mad at you when it happens because it's always going to happen especially in the winter, guys. People are going to get mud and snow all over their house. They can wrap their house in cellophane. It's still going to happen. What is the number one thing that you think is missing? So as you take your market share and you beat out other agents for that listing, are you able to identify maybe something that is missing in other listing presentations that you hear? We picked you because? Absolutely. What are those? Because we listen. I didn't come into that listing appointment and talk for an hour and tell you everything that I was going to do. I listened to an appointment for 45 minutes and listened to what you want me to do. That's the biggest difference. It's simple listening. Yes, Listen, yes, connection. True. He does not do the majority of the talking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. nice. Fascinating. I've heard some of our agents deploy, and I've had, I had personal success with this, but I want to come back. Um, go do your research. Right, go talk to other listing agents. Mm -hmm. I will tell you in, in this capacity, in my role, uh, not only is it completely authentic and true, but that leads them to their own conclusion. It's mm -hmm. one thing for me to say, Keller Williams is the best company for you to start your real estate career or transfer to if you're looking for extra leverage. Mm -hmm. But if you find that out on your own, mm -hmm. right, then that holds more water. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. And offer them a reference. Somebody who you closed with last week. Say, listen, if you need any additional references, I closed with Mr. and Mrs. Peters yesterday. They'd be happy to talk to you. And always ask your clients, you know, you ask for a referral, ask them, Can I, could you be a personal reference for me for one of my next appointments? If anybody has a question about your experience, would you accept a phone call? That's a huge difference. People aren't offering that. Absolutely. What do you think about this? I've heard some agents deploy the following script. And that is, what are you looking for in your next listing agent? where I've had personal experience with that is then that person will literally tell me what it is that they want. Mm -hmm. And then surprise, surprise, that's who I am. Absolutely. The other thing is, is remember we talked about pull the listing and maybe they tried to sell their house three years ago. So you say, you know, look, I know you tried to sell your house three years ago. What went wrong? What was missing? What didn't happen? Okay. So they tell you everything that were, they were upset about. Well, now, you know, I will, I, you know, we don't do it this way. Well, we do it this way. And then you make sure you remember those things that irritated them. It could be just as much as um, we just had somebody who said, I, I need to fire my agent. I've had um, 16 showings and I have no idea about the feedback. They keep saying me, nobody filled out the feedback form. Got it. So we know after every closing, we're, after every showing, we're going to call you and we're going to even say to you, we haven't heard back, but we wanted you to know. If we're doing the same thing, we're just making a phone call to say we haven't heard anything. It makes them happy. Uh, Don, we just, if you are willing to share, <laughs> raw, uh, epic fail that you've learned from in a listing, that you're still like, oh, but you've learned from it. And Absolutely. I think that's a great question. It was the original of coming there and having um, the CMA with me, 
It was having all of these things that I was going to inundate them with ridiculous information that they're never going to care or know about because they have no care about how much, where you're going to advertise, how you're going to do that. They only want to know who you are and how you're going to help them. That was my biggest mistake. Do you have, for those clients that you have that don't have much to say, do you have something, I'm assuming by this point you do, but something in your pocket that you're able to say, this is what we, we do do? Uh -huh. um, or, you know, because there's a couple that, that don't know, right. don't know what they want. Absolutely. And it's always to say, always ask them if they've ever sold a house before, because then you say, well, that's great. Well, we're going to educate you. This is a big concern. We want to make sure you have every step of the way. So let's go over that. And the other thing you definitely want to say is if you're at an interview, because that's what it is, with an a, a homeowner to sell their house and they're not really saying much, start asking interview questions. Say, you know, hey, I'm going to ask you, mister, but, you know, missus, please let him answer. What are the five things you love about this house that I can use in a description? What are the three things you don't like about your house? And then she's like, but, but, and then now it's her turn and she's got to always outdo him. So ask the guy first. <laughs> and then she'll be like, well, and then he'll be like, oh yeah, that too. And now you've got a description and they didn't even realize they helped you, but you asked them about the house. Cause you know, like I just redid my house. I bought my house in December and I have redone the whole thing. If you ask me what I love about my house, I can talk to you for four hours about what I've done to my house. And you could use that in the description. And you remember this is somebody's house where they had their kids. They've their kids have walked up those stairs. They've lost pets. Some people have lost children in that house. They brought their parents. Their parents have died in that house. Remember that emotion. That's important. Remember that. A lot of listing agents forget that this is an emotional decision and nurture that emotion with them. What about? Oh, we got another one. Do you do any kind of pre-appointment package and if you do, what's in it? No. Once you guys notice something, what you on Zoom are not seeing in real time is uh, there are like the top five realtors in our company and, and one of them, Rich Tepper, has asked me four questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not rich. And this is this is this is why I think this that, is why we talked about what we did yesterday yeah. about why we should have this. Yeah, there is and I, I wonder if you two would agree, uh, Rich, there is not one point where you know everything there is to know correct about this business correct and rich is so successful we were talking about that i would love to have a conversation with rich i said that yesterday i'd love to just sit and talk to rich about what he does and it's what rich does is completely different than what i do which is why masterminding with other agents can only help you guys you are never going to learn enough and learning from people like rich are going to be exceptional because we can all learn from each other yeah guess where you can't do that <laughs> I didn't say nothing. <laughs> it looks like The Sims. I'll say that. <laughs> uh, all right, let me ask you. So we got just a few more minutes here. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you guys have any other remaining questions, throw those out. But one, yeah, one so, that I have. Go so ahead. Don, once you get the listing, because uh, then it's like game time, right? Then we actually have to follow through on everything we right. talked about with that. What does your communication look like up until getting an offer? Absolutely. It's a great question. Well, I will tell you. So pre-assistant. Somebody from my team is me once and somebody from my team was trying to reach out to them or have an open house once a week, communicating with them via email. Make sure you communicate. Don't just get that listing and then never talk to them again. Especially the number one point that you have to remember the most communication is from contract to a second or third showing. You want to let them know that now your, your house is live. Now here's, remember, let's go over the showing instructions again. Make sure you, how did that first showing go? How many of you guys never call your clients and say, how was that first showing? Don't forget to call them. That was a big deal. They had their first showing. So communication and make sure that that continues. And then once you get a contract, same thing. Now they've never sold their house. They don't know what happens next. What's an appraisal? What's a FHA inspection? What does that mean? What, what do you mean? Why is this lawyer sending me something about this amendment? What is this? Somebody just called me yesterday and I was upset that we didn't call her first about the FHA mandatory clause because it's basically an escape clause. She heard the word escape when she Googled it. She's like, what does that mean? And went into a panic. And that was on us. We should have informed them that that was coming. So be ahead and educate. It's something like we're, we're in this day to day. So we mm -hmm. think that people, 
and I make this mistake in our world, we think that people understand our terms and right. the way that things go. Right. Where it's a little bit different here at KW, we have different terms for things that don't exist out there in the world. And for most people, I mean, what's the average, right? It's five to seven years. Mm -hmm. So while you might do it every single day or if you're new, like once a month, right. this is the first time they've done it maybe ever. Ever. Uh, or they haven't done it in the last seven years. Correct. Or they bought a house and they've never sold a house and it's completely different. So you have to educate them that there's a complete different side when you buy than there is when you sell. Right. And I'm telling you, it's educate, educate, educate. And the more that you educate yourself, the more confidence you have, the more you can educate your clients, the more confidence they'll have in you. So where you see this education show up uh, in other industries, take Starbucks, for instance. Mm -hmm. The reason why Starbucks was so successful is because you weren't just getting a cup of coffee. They were educating you about the way the coffee was ground Brewed, right. the different types of drinks. And so you can walk into a Starbucks location and ask questions. And those baristas are trained to educate you in the process. They're also trained to flatter you. And I went to Dunkin' Donuts today. <laughs> I have to tell you, I went to Dunkin' Donuts today and I'm not going back because she didn't, they didn't say much to me except to offer me sweet milk. But at <laughs> Starbucks, she told me yesterday that my hair looked good, I, that I had a great smile. I'm going there daily. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jot that down. All right, let me ask you one last question. Uh -huh. uh, so a lot of what we find success in is based in authenticity. Mm -hmm. And authenticity then translates to advocacy that they feel. Mm -hmm. So when you are in the listing process, how do you get to this advocacy level with them? Are you deploying certain things when you're talking to them? Are you being you? Just be you. Listen, it's the same thing. If you went to a job interview and you were pretending to be somebody else, what's going to happen to you at your 30 day review? Mm -hmm. Bye. Same thing. Be who you are. Be the same person. I, I would probably say, uh, and Jen will probably tell you this as a fault. I am probably too much like myself. In an interview, <laughs> in a listening interview, <laughs> stop laughing. Lisa and I were actually having a conversation about this. Just, I went out to lunch with her on Sunday, and Lisa Pensky and I, who was on our team too, were like, "This woman is crazy." <laughs> to a listing appointment in flip flops with her Cubs mom hat on, uh -huh. and like she, like dawn is dawn, love it, leave it, she's her. So yes, like I know because at the end of the day. They don't give a crap if you're with Keller Williams, Remax, Century 21. If they like you and they think you're a genuine person that likes them, they're going to work with you and they're going to refer you. Absolutely. you got to be relatable. And nobody is getting dressed in nice outfits on a Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It is pajama day, and you're lucky I'm not in your listing in a pajama. And I have gone to pajama bottoms once. <laughs> Amazing. All right. We all I do have me a one favor. question I really want to ask. Yeah, yes. go for it. Okay, so like we do with all of this stuff and everyone leaks here like, oh yeah, Dawn knows what she's doing, right? She's the best at it. If you were to say you have one area of opportunity when it comes to listing appointments, what would it be? You mean to, what do you like mean? Like where you could even improve your listing appointment oh, even more. A hundred percent, I could say probably be more prepared for what a listing appointment is. Because I think that sometimes I'm too much fly by the seat of my pants. Like I have an appointment at two o'clock. I have nothing. I don't even know what the house looks like. And I should probably have an idea as if it's an older house or not. And I should probably improve on that. But I'll be honest, I'm scared to change what I've done because it's working for me. And I don't want to start going into with too much of a preconceived motion. So, but I would probably see a little bit more prepared. Yeah, Rich. Um, in that regard, I have a thought on that. Um, obviously, when you deal with engineers, they want to be seeing someone who's more prepared. So if you have some clue, maybe as to the personality types of people you're interviewing, that maybe you would approach it differently. I'm just thinking. Well, that. I will tell you this to, to hit on that. I do have this really beautiful professional looking listing appointment, um, a pat, you know, book that if I saw somebody who I think needed more information, we would probably end up opening that a little bit more. And going through that to see, so they absolutely see it. Um, but I will tell you that when you come with so much education, they don't even really look at that. Can I ask a real quick question? Do you ask them what 
they believe their homes work. Yes, I always do. And I make it a game. So what I say to them, instead of saying, hey, what do you think it's worth? And I'll tell you real quick why I do that, because I want to know if they think their house is worth 300 and I'm coming in at 240, how I'm going to approach this part two of the conversation with them. So I make it a game. If there's a his and a her, I say, OK, now I ask you the fun question. We're going to have a bet and it's a five dollar st Starbucks gift card for whoever gets closest. What do you think the house is worth? Could you put that on a piece of paper? And what do you think the house is worth on a piece of paper? And I'll let you know later what I think it is. And you get a $5 Starbucks gift card. They love that. And then they're more realistic. Because Correct. Correct. I know it's the stupidest thing, but people, I tell you that's Starbucks. Well, you, as long as they're flattering like, me, I'm fine. Going back on them, like when we get offers and they're like, well, you know, I really thought that it would be, and John will be like, Remember when we talked at the listing appointment and you said you'd be happy if you got blah, blah, blah? Well, here it is. Right. Because, you know, then I'll, they'll say, I want 250. Well, I'll list it for two. I'll say, well, guess what? We're going to list it for 275. And I think you'll get maybe somewhere between 265 and 268. Yay! Well, they get 259. And they're like, yeah, no, I'm not interested. I'm like, well, you were happy with 250. I got you nine grand more. Oh, yeah, you're right. All right, let's go to 262. It changes the whole perception. So play the Starbucks game. <laughs> and they don't know what each other is saying. No, I mean, I'm sure they talk about it later because they really want to know who wins. <laughs> and the guy's going to give the Starbucks gift card. A hundred percent. Awesome. Well, thank you. For You're this. welcome. A uh, round of applause if this was awesome. Thank you. All right. Next up, we are bringing in uh, the folks that are helping us lead your commercial division. If you guys want to start heading this way. Um, so we are bringing in front of you uh, what has been operating in a not so behind the scenes fashion. Uh, this is an effort that you are going to see more of in 2022. Uh, here's what we know. We know that the brokerage is made up of what has been identified as the top 20% and then the 80% that makes up the whole. And the mistake that has been made up until now uh, was that we were communicating with you in one way. And the reality is, is that for some of you, certain things are important. And what some of you have asked for is how to diversify your real estate business. Well, you guys wanna come on down? The way that you do that is through acquiring uh, multiple ways to close different types of property. And so you're going to hear from the commercial division and how you all could get involved in the commercial division. And it's not just a tape and string operation. And there's a lot of business uh, being done in that division. So I'm going to hand that off. Bear with us while we transition here. And we'll see you guys again soon. Perfect timing. Okay, just a recap of the commercial group. And I can't see my slide. So move the slide up. <laughs> I should have looked. Usually we can't, the same thing, we can't get rid of it. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, this part has yeah. to stay. All right, so now let's beat the team. And unfortunately, Stephanie, where are you? We didn't get your mugshot from the post office, so it's not on here yet. That's all right. I'll move up to you because <laughs> show my face to people. So here's our team of players. Just like a slow internet tonight. We're tonight. <laughs> There we go. Keep, no, go on. We don't care about us. <laughs> so this is the group that we've added on. We had what five? We had five. when we started in the beginning twelve months ago. There were five of us. As of today, there are thirty-one. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. She's oh, our thirty-two. Thirty-two. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, the picture's not on here, but we'll be there shortly. I can go stand next to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it's been really a lot of fun and it's going to, you know, think about it just for 12 months or you want to really say 11 and a half months since we've grown and it's growing. At least we'll tell you how much it's growing shortly to so go to my next slide. You know, and the reality of the whole thing, there's a third the reality. This is actually grown because of Peggy, Lisa, Jordan. And our staff, you know, the people here, the support office here is absolutely fantastic. And that's the thing I want to really thank everybody. But there's one thing I need to correct Dan on. He had actually put in the post a little secret. And I'm telling you guys, and I'll tell you this in I hour, said that. You said that. You said that. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was you. 
Yeah, and, and truthfully, there are absolutely no secrets in commercial real estate. None. The other day, I felt like you always heard the little uh, kid looking for a pony. It was in the, the barn, and there's all kinds of, you know, all over the thing. And he's very positive. He said, Dad, there's somewhere there's a pony hidden. Well, I look at all these websites, the secrets of commercial real estate, the secrets of investing, the secrets of real estate. There are no secrets. They're all a bunch of flim flam mans trying to sell a book, except for Derek Keller. His books are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> They're legit. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> little clarification there. So honestly, there are absolutely no secrets in this business whatsoever. And you know, it's my frustration really to get in your head. I hate to pay myself with a pain. Literally, I've been down all these down these roads. And I'll let you guys go down the road so far until I see a landmine, and then I'll pull you over this side to avoid the landmine. But I'll let you guys learn on your own with my guidance. But I'm going to give you the road, a little bit of rope, but I won't let you hang yourself. Ask Lisa, ask several people. You know, Vicky's still alive. A, <laughs> still alive. <laughs> I mean, Vicky's a perfect example. She did a fantastic job on selling an investment property in the Riddleville area. You know, I can't say anything more. She did a great job, but she, you know, she was going back and forth and we, we made it work. So again, I'm available from nine a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m. at night to talk to anybody seven days a week. I have no problem talking to people. I really enjoy giving back what I've learned over the last 55 years. You know, I've told a couple of people, the true definition of love is the unselfish desire to make the other person happy. But this really makes me very, very happy to give back what I've learned. Plus, it's the key to heaven. Because God's going to answer that one question. What did you do with the gift talents I gave you? So I have something to give back. And I'm really willing to give it back. Next one is, you, this is all about Lisa. No. It's not all about me. Well, but both There's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could click on the close. Um, so Colleen graciously got this situated for us like at the last minute, so we appreciate her. Um, basically, this is just the stuff that happened in the past year for our team. Um, Marty and I partnered on a couple of them. He did a few, I did a few, a few other people um, partnered in some of these deals. So everything you see here has happened in the last um, 12 months and were things that our team put together. And this is all because we finally have an actual division doing the work, knowing what we're doing and, and getting referrals from a lot of you residential agents who are not part of our commercial team. Pretty much every single one of these that I closed was a referral. So that person saw 25% of the check at the end of the day, just by making a phone call. Um, and so it's for life. I That's honor that idea. forever and ever and ever. Our team honors it forever and ever. If the next person goes and buys another bigger property, they get 25% again, so on and so forth. So just keep sending them in. We're happy to service them for you. If you don't feel comfortable joining our team. If you feel comfortable joining our team, though, we'd love to have you. And that's not just Keller Williams agents, right? That's yeah. anybody. So if you look at the stuff that's closed, if any of your clients ask, have you ever done this stuff? You could say, very yes, our department has done it. And you send them the website and you ban right. it like I am right now. Because I, <laughs> on the stuff, there's local stuff we've done locally. There's also national stuff that this department has done with the national tenants. Yes, if you notice, if you want to scroll back up, if you notice there are certain national tenants like Spencer's, Bath and Body Works. Um, so if they ask if we've worked with national brands, the answer is yes. And you just direct them to the website and they can see for themselves that the national tenants have been represented. And historically, this man has represented national tenants for over 50 years. So he's he's got connections with a large group of them. Um, and I talk to several people in those areas every day. So that's been kind of a fun thing. So again, I'm saying there's nothing that I have not done. It literally, you know, I could say, this, but if I ever cross that bridge or a stumbling block, I could pick up the phone and call some of my friends in this industry and say, hey, what the hell is going on? And they'll tell me. Mm -hmm. Commercial is all about business relationships, sharing each other. We do really protect each other, something first. So, new listings? Yep. Next up is the active listings. Um, we had invited some people here to share their listings um, today, but unfortunately they weren't able to attend except for Bobby, but we don't have ours on the screen yet because ours isn't completely signed up. Um, so 
So let me start with the first one. Um, this is just so you guys are aware of what we're offering within our office. We want to make sure you have an opportunity to present your listings every single month. So if you get a new listing, we'll obviously already know about it. We'll make sure you can stand up here for one minute and present each one. So I'm going to do a quick like overview of each one so you have an idea. And then if you think you have a client that matches that listing really well, just see whoever the listing agent is at the end. If it's a co-listing, feel free to reach out. So in this case, we've got Ken Hesselback and myself. Um, this one is Municipal Drive. It's in McHenry. It's right next door to their Village Hall. Um, it's a really great corner spot. It's more of an investment property. So um, this one is half of the building is for sale in, as individual units or as a package deal. It's a great opportunity for investors who want tenants in place and just want an easy first investment because the range is like 60000 up to 600000 So you've got like a good play money situation there where you could potentially... That's the one vacant unit, by the way. This is the only vacant unit that we have for sale. Um, Are they listed separately? They're separately and together. So okay. you can see it. We have it on MLS. We have it on Buildout. We have it on CoStar. We have it on LoopNet. We have it on Prexy. It is on every single site because I practice what I preach. If I tell you to put it on every site, we put it on every site. Um, so the next one really quick. When I say women and I mean it, <laughs> I honor time. This is going down to Ripley since you talked for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next one is um, Green Bay Road. You don't have to pull up that whole thing. Um, it, it looks like this, so it's really not necessary. <laughs> it's grass. We have grass for selling Green Bay. Um, so this one is a um, currently zoned mixed use. We're working on getting a fully zoned only commercial um, because the person bought residential lots on one road commercial lots on the other road, and they're combining them to be one commercial zone space. So it's a huge lot. Um, it's offering at $500,000. Um, it's right there on the main major thoroughfare. So a really great flat, already pre-cleared location for any type of use. I mean, they are pretty wide open in that community. They're like, bring us business, please. So bring up some business. Um, next one. This one's McLean Boulevard in Elgin. Um, this one is visible from the highway and McLean, so it's a really great corner spot. It used to be a gas station, has been completely fully remediated. All of the stuff has been done, so don't have to worry about that. It's my key investor, so we know we did it right, thank God. Smaller lot, but great exposure. So this one is a great retail spot, so if you have somebody looking for really good retail exposure, I would strongly recommend this site. Next one. Oh, your turn. This is Matt's. This is Matt's that. property in <laughs> Chicago Heights. This is a little frustrating because the great site is two and a half acres and ownership would really like to unload it, but we have not gotten one iota good contract on it. For 350, you could have this whole situation. Is it fully filled with tenants? No, it's half tenant, half. Half and half. So it could be a user operator in right. one part and then a um, investment for the other part. So that's a great opportunity for Are some. they all retail? Yes. Yeah. All right, Higgins, this is an office space that we have listed right now. It's a really greatly accessible um, office space to um, the L. You can walk to it. Um, really good visibility on Higgins. Um, it's currently used as an office, but it could be used as a retail for the zoning. Um, so it could go either direction. We've had a lot of interest for this particular one um, to be like a restaurant conversion or a, uh, a office daycare conversion. Um, so there's tons of potential for this one, very solid building. Um, the only in inhibiting factor is the parking. So that it's street parking, it's typical of the city, it's what we're used to, it's, it is what it is. Um, but everything else is just excellent in that building. You're up. Jim Marin Angles building. This is in uh, McHenry, this is a really neat building. It's an old industrial uh, warehouse where they actually rebuilt these big generators. And it's 12,000 square feet on the first floor, 4,000 square feet on the mezzanine area, right next to the train station. It's absolutely ideal. The uh, owner's going to divide it up into four retail spaces. Uh, and it's market wise, it's about $11 a square foot retail gross, which is really good for McKenna. It's really good. It's very good. It's a nice piece of property. The tenant will vacate by the end of this month, and the rehab is going to start immediately. And also, if you guys are familiar with Plum Grove restaurant in McHenry, it's Plum right Garden. down the street. Right. Plum Garden, that's right. Plum Garden restaurant. It's right down the street. <laughs> so can. it's kind of that weird zoning where it's retail and industrial smushed into a little triangle. Right. But it's really a great site. You also could buy it for 950 
yeah, so there's options with this particular site. And then my personal um, place where I live right now, it feels like I'm there every freaking day, um, is 951 North Palm Grove Road. So this is my office space in Schaumburg that has the separate entries. Um, it's for sale and for lease. Um, currently, there is only one tenant in place that wants to remain long term. Um, so it's great for a medical use. It's excellent for like a COVID testing site, um, an office space. Um, we've had a lot of accountants looking at it that seem to have a lot of interest. Um, so, or like workout type situation. We've had some people who are there with like med spa type uses. So it's got a lot of potential. It's one of the lowest rent rates on a nicest build out I've seen in that business park in particular, which is why we get a lot of interest. Um, but we're looking for exactly the right person. So um, this one's a really great site. And like I said, I'm practically there every day. So if you have someone who needs to see it, I'll probably be there at some point. Wait, Lisa, is that this one for sale or lease? Both. Both. Yeah. How square feet does it have? It, the total for the whole building is 5,600, I think, roughly. So, yeah. yeah. Roughly 5,600. Um, the biggest space is on um, 3,200 square feet. Um, that's vacant right now. And what is that called for the lease? The uh, price for sale is 500,000. Price per square foot, I think, is 1450 right now. It's either 14 or 1450 right now. Page. That's modified gross. Oh, modified gross. Yeah. What's, what's, I'm sorry, what's the smallest space that could be? Smallest was like 1062, I think. It's like right around 1,000. Yeah. Yeah, so it, they're all different sizes, um, all the same build out though. So the nice thing is, is like you could adjoin one side with another and combine it to a 5,000 square foot space. So we've had a lot of people who are kind of looking into that too, because it used to be an adjoining space before. So it's really easy to put a corridor back in where it used to be. Um, it's a really nice site. I really like this one a lot. And it's starting to get a ton of interest now that people are going back to offices again. We're starting to see it pick back up. So that's actually a really good sign for Schaumburg Markets. Um, and the only one that's not in here, because so that was the last one, right? If Bobby and I are working on a planned unit development agreement, we can't really get into any details yet. Um, but we've never done it before. And it's really exciting because Marty is showing us the way. And we've been having a lot of fun meetings. And we're just really excited. So we'll share that with you. Hopefully in a month or two is what we're thinking. <laughs> How I'm showing in a way is I'm letting them go down the street. And there's a couple of things they've done very nicely. I said, okay, but now the documentation, we're going to flip over this way. And the way I learned that documentation is what Don Bremer said. You know, she's uh, the McHenry she's commissioner in McHenry. Well, I was a commissioner in Evanston for 20 years. So I'm taking that experience, those documentations, and all the stuff I do for municipalities to say, hey, we're going to go this way. At least, how do you do that? So I showed her all the different agreements. There's a lot of papers. <laughs> it's like 90 pages of papers. Now, I'm not an attorney. I don't practice law, but I do a lot of plagiarism. That's yeah. <laughs> the right word for it. At least you're honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the reality in real estate, especially in commercial real estate, there's a ton of plagiarism. We all share each other's ideas. I get calls from attorneys all the time saying, you know, actually, we've been down to this. Give me a good paragraph for that. What's this? Um, I sent one of the agents, he wanted to look about leases. They said, we don't do leases, but I'll give you some copies of leases so you can figure out the terminology. The best lease I ever did, a landlord-tenant lease, it took about a day to go through it. Usually a commercial national lease, about three weeks. It's a men's warehouse. They have learned how to work leases both sides. It's a great lease. So there's you know, this sharing back and forth. So if you guys want to you know get involved, get more listings, get your name out, get involved in the municipality. It really helps out a lot. It's huge. It really is huge. Uh, question about that. Yeah. My municipality or village or whatever is like the, the woman who's the president of the chamber is a realtor. And so that's for that reason I didn't get involved because I felt like maybe she wouldn't want me there. Do you see any which municipal no. Like I was going to do um, like uh, Lake County and I think the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Chamber of Commerce is Pat Smarrow. So I was like, yeah, Why not do you it? can't usually join a chamber with another like they don't usually have the multiple. same industry, right? Right. But if you're commercial and they're residential, you can. Oh, so, so if I come in as the commercial person? Correct. Yes. yes, that would be the best way to run it. And 
honestly have me introduce you to her because she and I are best. Oh, yeah, she's really yeah. sweet. <laughs> and people who were elected to the uh, Chamber of Commerce or even to the, the municipal board, they have to recuse themselves of anything to do with real estate. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, they really don't practice real estate at all. They leave it, you know, alone. It's kind of you have to. They can't vote. They can't do anything. Sometimes they can't even go to executive session meetings. There's a, there's a whole code, a municipal code. So they recuse themselves from the business chamber real estate, not from practicing real estate. You're right. They have to okay. recuse okay. themselves from the chamber and stuff. Yeah. So it's. But getting on plan unit development boards, getting involved in anything yeah. that's a development process in your municipality is a great opportunity for you to A, know what's going on in your municipality all the time. So you can better educate your clients, yourself, us. Um, but also it gives you that edge if something happens within the municipality and they're trying to give a new developer a name of someone that's really good to interview, guess whose name is probably going to come up? Right. The person they know, that they trust, that they love, that they know knows their best interests at heart and wants to build and develop that community too. Um, so yeah, classes we offered this year um, were script training. Um, that one was recorded. It is on the KWSR page. Um, efficient lead generation. Um, I think that was prior to recordings. Um, listing presentations we've gone over, valuation classes, syndication, searching, and zoning. Searching and zoning, I believe, was also recorded. I think that one's also on the yeah. page. Upcoming, Marty will be teaching <laughs> us how to take a property and dissect it and analyze it and come up with comps, understanding how to use the tools we have in place financially to figure out what the valuation of a property is worth. And we're actually going to all try to attempt to do it together, kind of like what Don was saying with like cards. Um, we're all going to attempt our own valuation and then see if we can hit the same numbers that Marty has. Um, we're going to do another leases class. We've done them several times before. It seems to be a highly needed class. And so after we're going to record this one, so we have it in our library. Um, a real next CM CRM class will be coming. It'll probably be towards the middle of the year once we kind of <laughs> figure it out for ourselves. Yes. We're, we're going to give Bobby the uh assignment of figuring it out because he and I were on <laughs> yeah Bobby's in charge of the real next interpretation of data we were on the zoom thing from Austin what two weeks ago and it's very comprehensive and it looks like we really want to use it but you know halfway through it it's a lot it's a lot it's, a lot. So it's really, really wonderful though yeah and we'll get into more into that later LOIs is our next class that'll be coming up probably in January, most likely. So it'll be how to formulate an LOI, what the differences are between the different uses. Um, obviously, we have LOI-based forms that we utilize as a group. You guys already know this that are part of our group. Um, what is that? Letter of intent. It's our number one way of making an offer. Okay. Um, and then shadowing of opportunities has been requested extensively in the past month. We've had probably six. I think, Joe, you were one of them. We had six or seven people ask for shadowing opportunities. So whenever we get calls about going to evaluate a property or something, we're going to be trying to set up times to open that up to other people to be a participant in that process. Like uh, one day, Matt showed me on a listing presentation in Skokie. It's not my listing, it's a referral. So I turned around and gave it to Matt, but he shadowed me how to get the thing off. Mm, yeah, so we'll be offering those opportunities. I've taken a couple people out. Jerry went out with me to hike in short sleeves in sub zero temperatures um, <laughs> through a property in Barrington. I recommend wearing a coat if you go with me. Um, but I grab people randomly too in the office. If I get a random phone call and you have to be circulating, I'll be like, I'm running to this place. You want to come? You know, that's just my personality. All right. Um, and the future of KW Commercial is um, Real Next, which we kind of touched on. So what's happening is if you were to join KW Commercial and pay the monthly fee, this is not the mentoring program. This is separate. This is overview. So when you start moving up in the process, Real Next and Nucleus are the two things that I've been honing in on for the last few months that are being offered as part of our package that we've never had before. So Nucleus is the trainings that are recorded. There's about, I believe, 115, 120 that they're going to make available to us all at once. Um, to go ahead and take and use to develop our skill set. It's fabulous training. It usually costs $400 to $900 a month, depending on which package you're a part of. So this can be included. So I love that because I don't like paying $400 to $900 a month. Um, we don't know exactly when that's rolling out. We've been waiting to hear back from Austin. They, we have one leader that has COVID and it's just been a little chaotic for the last week. So we should know more in the coming two or three weeks. Real Next is the data platform that they're using for us instead of command to put our clients into where we can group them. 
by investor groups, by multiple types of property groups, it's a connective type CRM. So it's a lot more layering than you would see in a normal CRM for a residential agent. It's strip, it's like intended for investment purposes. Um, so we love that. Build out, if you recall, the thing we were showing you all of our listings on is going away. Realnex actually incorporates it within their own system. So now we will have our landing pages provided as part of it. As Instead of doing build out, we get to do it here. It also links it to the ownership in this system. So what's really cool is instead of my my lovely human Jordan that is half my brain, having to use three systems to do all of our inputs for each of our commercial listings. Now we have one system to do literally everything. So I'm very excited about it. It is a lot of data, it's a lot to take in. So as we learned, Bobby was on a training, you were on a training, um, Jordan's been on the training. I sort of sat through 10 minutes of one and was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so I'll let her figure it out and teach me because that's easier. Um, but once we learn it, we'll be teaching it to you guys as you decide to become a part of KW Commercial formally and pay those fees to get that access to those resources. But as you know, so far, we've encouraged you to hold off on doing that until it all gets fully rolled out. We don't want people paying money, you know, just to use the logo. And we also want to make sure you're at a space in your business where it makes sense for you to be expending that type of cash. What's beautiful is it used to be an annual commitment. It is now a monthly commitment. So if you decide there's been a really crappy season for you, three months of not getting enough money, can't justify it, you did a lot of education for the last three months, you're good to go for a while, you can actually cancel it temporarily if you need to. So I love that because it gives us more leverage and more opportunity. That's it. Oh, well, then we missed one of the slides. So um, one of the things that we really wanted to touch on in this meeting, um, because it's the end of the year and we've got five minutes, so I get to do the rah rah like cheerleading moment. Um, I warned Marty I was going to do like a dance or something. Game That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, closed business this year for me personally has really increased in the commercial side of things. And I just want to use it as a really great encouragement to all of you because. I was exactly in the same position as the majority of you lovely humans that I can see here. I don't know if it's on the screen, but who I can see here in front of me. I was in the same position three years ago as all of you just starting my commercial path and was making probably $5,000 a year on commercial, maybe, usually, um, and kind of feeling my way through it with some guidance once he joined to help me two years ago. But prior to that, no guidance. And then once he started to help me, it started to pick up a little here, a little there. Last year was a little low, you know, on my experience with the commercial, as was my check. But this year, my income has gone up $29,000 because of commercial business. And largely, that is because of the lovely humans in this office that have referred business to me. Um, and so of that, you know, over $6,200 were given back to other agents because of that. And I am very appreciative of the trust. And what's really cool is I'm now so busy that you guys are starting to feel more of that coming back to you. And it's only going to pick up like the momentum is there now. And I'm just so excited because now we're pushing a lot of that business out this way. And it's been really cool to watch and to experience. Um, so just know that we really appreciate all of you and the everyone who's not a part of our team that's watching on Zoom land. Um, just know, you know, referrals we love. This group here can handle them. So the real wealth in real estate is investing in real estate long term. So you're going to do fine selling houses, which is your base, but then slowly but surely work your way into commercial real estate. And it is really the real base of long-term retirement income. And I'm somewhere as a proof of that pudding because I raised six kids, four daughters, and two sons. The only debt he and I have is our house and car. You know, you don't, you know, you don't save any money raising six kids. But what I did, I said the money I made, etc., cetera, gave it back as memories. So we have a tremendous amount of memories. The, the reality is, if you leave your children a lot of money, they piss it away. <laughs> they can't forget their memories. And I think that's one of the nicest things about my kids. Every time we sit down, we talk about memories. And that's the beauty of this whole relationship, is to give back to your families. 
it, commercial real estate is not, it, again, I'll say it again, not difficult. There's no secrets, no help you else. Your base is residential. There's no doubt about it. But you can play both of them together. It works out very nicely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, does anyone have any questions about the listing that we presented today? Since we do have an extra three minutes, I'd be happy to answer any. Marty will. Watch the clock. Yeah, always. <laughs> we have somebody after us. I have to like rotate. Um, do you encourage people to share your listings and say? Absolutely. Yeah. Always. And commercial sharing is like the biggest element in cooperation. So. In residential, we did tend to be a little more like this with especially outside brokerages. Um, in commercial, there's a lot more of this, even with outside brokerages. Like I get emails from other brokers all the time in commercial going, hey, Lise, do you mind looking at this one? Do you think my price is right? What do you think? Can you share this with? There's a lot of exchange that takes place. And like if I get a, a situation like we had a hotel request situation like, I don't know, it was a year ago. And um, neither of us have done hotels. I will flat out tell you, I know nothing about hotels. The math involving hotels is completely different. So we reached out. I knew a guy in California that's with KW um, who runs the hotel division for KW. Dan's actually from here. He's from Chicago. So I called him up. I'm like, I got a hotel in Chicago situation. I have no idea where to begin with it. What do I do? He immediately got on a call with me. And this man runs a huge team, huge operation and spent 30 minutes talking me through it. Well, then we met Raj at our um, Austin. He's the other hotel guy. He's based out of Texas. Same story, I'll fly out in a heartbeat if you need me, both of them. So, you know, we've got this crew of people, not just here, which ours is kind of phenomenal. I mean, 32, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> we got an awesome crew of people, but we also have extensive networking out there that helps and is willing to cooperate and collaborate on deals. So hey, look, for example, five years ago, I had a hotel firm looking for space. They hired me. I found space in New York, Atlanta, Chicago, San Francisco, Portland. Do you have to be licensed for those? No. As long as you have it. No, if you have a cooperate agreement with these other agents across the state lines, you can do it. Like a referral? It's, well, it's cooperate uh, agreement. You're still involved. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But so I'm saying to you. It's not hands off. There, okay. there, people that I literally called up in those different towns, cities that I knew from working with GMAC. Say, hey guys, I got this going. Can you help me? Absolutely. Yeah. So I can't wait to learn. <laughs> I just want more. <laughs> no, it, it really is a lot of fun. And I have you know, a tremendous amount of crazy stories of some of the people I've worked with. Uh, the most famous guy I worked with way in the beginning when he didn't have, you know what the, was uh, a little company called McDonald's. When I started working with, as an outside broker, they had no money. Back in 1967, they had no money. I had to put the whole package together. No, seriously. But, uh, now, he used to be head of all McDonald's real estate, the whole worldwide. Is my son's godfather, so every once in a while I'll call up George and say, Hey, what the hell's going on? Can you tell me? Bring back the microhub. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a connection that you make through being honest and helping each other out and not stealing. I mean, it's there. You know, I have, I've, I've told Dan I have absolutely no fear whatsoever. This department's going to be very successful because the company is behind it. When I sat in Austin a month ago, listening to Gary Keller, I watched his whole body language. And the last thing I really liked it was Carl. What's Carl's last name? Weaver. Yeah. I looked him up immediately. He comes from a school that I wish I had to go. It was accepted, but I wasn't. He's an Annapolis graduate. Honor country. Oh, yeah. Good. Oh, you get a picture of this room, but round of applause for the crowd. Hey, we have a really quick announcement with you guys here, and then uh, we're going to take a break. So, uh, for those of you that are watching the stream, we're all going to have lunch now. And the next time you hear this microphone is when uh, Kim Brazilian from, I can't pronounce the new company that she's with, is going to present some stuff about a new company, a home warranty solution that you can tap into. Thank you for joining us for the Curse Vision. We'll be back uh, in about a half an hour for more content. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you then. Bye, guys. <laughs> All right, everybody, and we are back. As you can hear, our room is packed full. We have a lot of food. Uh, thank you to yes. Kim Bazillion of Achusa. Achosa? 
Either one. We'll all right. go with either Familiar one. Familiar face, new company. Tell them all yes. about it and I'll hit play with your writing. Awesome. So thanks again. Um, Kim Bazillion with a Choza home warranty. So I'm still getting used to pronouncing it. And I know a lot of people, that's their first question. They're like, you want me to change from saying three little letters, H-W-A, to a Choza? And I'm like, trust me, it'll be worth it. Um, so yes, I have made the move. Um, I made the move for multiple reasons. And I think that you will see that after I get done talking about it a little bit, after I play this short little clip that is just as simple as it can be and exactly how the Achosa experience goes when your clients have an actual claim. Let's face it, right? The only time a home warranty is relevant is when there is a claim. And when your client is having a claim, there's something that has failed in their home and their home is just not you know, up to speed. They, they're, it's an issue. Everything is an emergency typically. So with a Choza, what we do differently from all the other rest of the home warranty companies is we empower your clients to choose their own contractor to get out to the home as quickly as possible. With allowing them to get their own contractor, it just simplifies the home warranty claims process. Get, you, they could get somebody out there the same day that the system or appliance breaks, as opposed to being at the total mercy of a third party home warranty company or contractor and they're on their schedules. So it's a different model um, it's kind of like the future, but like today, um, I use the analogy all the time of, you know, you're not going to go and hail a taxi in downtown Chicago in the middle of January when you have that little Uber app, right? That Uber app, you can stay inside wherever you are, nice and warm. It's connected to your credit card. It's pretty secure for the most part. We've all heard the horror stories, right? Um, but once you have that experience, that Uber experience, you're never going to go back to the other side. And I'm hoping that, you know, that's exactly what your clients are going to tell you when they have the Achosa claim experience um, that you'll want to send everybody our way um, and, and kind of make the leap of faith with me and trust that this process does work. We just need to just needs to catch up. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and play this quick little video here. It is super simple, one minute of your time. And I think it'll really explain the process. So that's as, as simple as it is, your clients, call their own contractor, they get them out to the home, they diagnose the problem, they call into our customer service department, they say, okay, you know, after they receive the diagnosis, they say, this is what the warranty is going to cover. And then they ask that contractor, do you accept a credit card over the phone or do we need to mail you a check? So those contractors are getting paid in the home before, when the job is complete, in the home, while they before they leave. So it's just like any other, they're not waiting, you know, 30 days for a check from the home warranty for a job that they did in August or whatnot. So um, I, again, uh, this is day 12 for me. Um, so, uh, but I've been, this company has been after me for about two years now and I finally made the move because I'm no longer pregnant or any of all that stuff. So I'm ready. Um, call me any individual, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings and things, any questions you have, I'm going to stick around um, and answer those questions. Cause I know after probably seeing that and hearing the new model, there's going to be questions. It's newer. I get it. Um, so call me on individual basis. We'll have a quick conversation or a cup of coffee and really get into the nitty gritty sexy home warranty stuff listen we trust you and you made a switch so <laughs> let's see where this goes yeah we appreciate, appreciate you. that thank you for lunch yes. we appreciate all our sponsors thanks <laughs> bye all right and we are back okay so let me kind of lay out the rest of the schedule for today. Uh, if you are here in person, obviously finish up your eating. Uh, we have the world famous Kali No Shop. It's going to niche down, niche, niche. Niche because we're fancy. 
uh, your marketing effort. Uh, for a lot of you, this looks like going small to go big and telling your story to the people that are going to listen to you. So Colleen is gonna dive into that. If you are interested, Stephanie Welter is also gonna talk about goal setting. Uh, if I could say, somebody that was brand new uh, that is now at the top of their game is Stephanie Welter, and she did it through goal setting. So if you want that one-on-one -on -one interaction that you can only get here at KW, she'll be in the fireside chat section here shortly. Colleen, let's take it away. Okay, so um, I've kind of shortened up what I was going to talk about today to fit into our schedule. Um, but the biggest thing is um, like what and how of niching and then ultimately why it's going to save you marketing dollars. And I know Dan had mentioned like starting small to go big. I think we can always stay small to go big, to be honest, um, because we really want to talk to the people who are going to matter most to us, right? So for some examples, um, I pulled some Instagram accounts that I just want to highlight to you guys just because they do a good job and they're not all real estate or realtors. I chose two realtors and then two other options. So the first one, and I just want to post out, please don't have comparative reality to their followers. You do not need to have a big follower base to do a big business. Um, they do a really good job, so that's why their followers are this way. But they also have whole teams, most of them, who run their videos. So please just give yourself grace. Do not compare yourself. Um, but I just want to highlight the things they're doing really well and what they're all doing the same, right? Um, and we can really learn from that. So the first one is um, Brian sells Miami. So Brian loves his car. We can tell that immediately from his posts. So he's probably attracting just a lot of followers based off of this luxury vehicle, people who want those luxury vehicles. And he honestly, by looking at his post, talks about it a lot. So he's not even talking about real estate. He's sharing literally a passion of his and he's growing from it. The thing is, is half the time he parks his car in front of his luxury listings that he's selling. He's like, oh, Brian, the realtor is showing up at this luxury listing. And so he's marketing himself as a luxury agent. So that's something to think about is, you know, if you do have that nice car and you have the luxury listing, like it just kind of goes par for the course, right? He's also showing his lifestyle matches those of his clients, right? So he's going to attract those people just because their lifestyles kind of match. Now, you don't have to do luxury per se. Um, but if you have a specific lifestyle and you are going to those types of clients, like you're a lakefront, you sell lakefront properties and you have a house on the lake or you have a summer home on a lake, right? You can share that personal content that also shows like I'm an expert in luxury or lakefront real estate, right? So he does an interesting thing um, to kind of run that way. So that's this account. Um, the next one, this is not a real estate. This is one of my friends, actually. I went to high school with him. Um, but he does videos all about theme parks and theme park food. So he's built an entire following, and he's much bigger on TikTok. You see, he has 180K on TikTok. So that's where he started over the pandemic, so literally 2020. Um, but he literally just shares because he played Peter Pan at Disney World for a while in the college program that... These are the secrets behind Disney World and other theme parks. Um, he's since, you know, gotten some paid opportunities to go explore things. Um, but he really just niches around that. Like, that's not what he does for a job at all. He actually works at Fujifilm, like, down the road from our house. <laughs> like, I kid you not. Like, but that's what he does on the side. And now he's getting paid to, like, go to Chicago hotels and film his evening at the restaurant and things like that. Um, but... You know, he grew a big following just because theme parks, theme park food, and then he, like, made fun of people at theme parks. <laughs> and that was, like, the whole fun of it. So just something to think about is, like, if you have something you're really knowledgeable about, even if it doesn't have to do with your business, like, you can attract people to you and will find a way to get your real estate in there, too, right? So... I just want you to think about that. Obviously, this is a very different thing, but just what he did at a really high level. 
Um, the next, you may know her, Katie Lance. Now she does social media teaching for real estate agents. That's all she focuses on. She probably knows a ton more about marketing and other capacities for real estate, but she doesn't care. Like that's all she does. She goes social media marketing, but then by watching her on social media, I mean, she has 32,000 followers. So obviously growth from here. I know she has a whole team. If you've seen her webinars, like people are running that, but what she's doing is she's teaching you about social media, but in the end, you're going to end up in Forget Smart Academy, right? Because you want to learn all the things she has to say, and she doesn't just talk about social media and the academy. So that's why people buy in. They go to her seminars, things like that. So that's one of the great things I'd like to highlight is that if you just focus on first-time home buyers, it doesn't mean you're not going to get the downsizers, right? Once you establish yourself as an expert, they're going to say, okay, she really knows all about getting social smart, but then her program goes far beyond that. And like how to communicate with these leads once you get them, right? And things like that. So she kind of goes way beyond, but starts with just, this is how you post on social media. What accounts should I be using? All those things. And then the last one is another realtor. Again, ignore her followers. <laughs> 160,000. Um, but I, what I like to highlight about her, so she's a Florida realtor. Um, she really talks about, you know, living on the ocean, that like ocean lifestyle, boating, you see everything. And at the beginning, she didn't have money to do those things, but she would put herself in those situations, right? So she was like, fake it till you make it. So she made friends with the dock owner and was like, can I take a few videos on your boat? right now she has her own boat and then essentially what she's saying is like you can do it too like real estate investing right like she's grown her money from this so that's like a very specific specific ocean florida lifestyle adventure kind of water sports she does all of that um and frankly if you look at her profile it's very crafted <coughs> She's always using pinks and whites and blacks. Like she's just got a very crafted profile. So it's aesthetically pleasing. Um, and she does lots and lots of video. So I just want to like highlight some of those. And I just want to point out the thing that they're, the things they're all doing, right? To grow their social media. And this is just on Instagram, but you can do on Facebook as well. Um, the first thing is you'll notice they all have these little circles around their profile pictures. That means they have active stories. So stories are the things that come up, they last 24 hours and they disappear. I have also noticed that I'm getting more leads from my stories than I am through posts. So this is where they're going to show up every day, show the behind the scenes of their life, show the interesting things that they're doing. And personally, that's going to tell your story. And I tell you guys to tell your story all the time, right? So showing that behind the scenes of your day is really going to allow people to meet you. So if you are a mom of hockey players, like show the games, right? You're going to make friends with those other hockey moms. Maybe you'll get people asking, oh, like what club did your kids join? You're going to make a connection that way. So stories are a great way to do it. The next you'll see they have um, not their website, but a link to like a link tree or a beacon site. And one of those is where you can put multiple links on the site. So if you want to send them back to your Facebook page, to your website, to literally a consultation link to directly send their info to you, that's what they're using. And then as they get brand deals and things like that, they can also put like affiliate codes and things in there. Um, but they're all using that. Um, so they don't waste their solo link on Instagram, right? On Instagram, you have no other links. You get one link. So they want to show and push people to multiple things. So they have this one link that shows a bunch of links once they click on it. Um, so like for the office, we're doing one for like move with KW. Do you want to become an agent? And it's like, are you needing an agent? Here you go. Like, so Is that in their profile? Correct. Yes. That they, they have that? Okay. Yeah. So it's in their profile information. Um, you'll also notice um, the usage of, well, not for him. He actually does a bad job. Um, but like Max does theme parks and food. So this name for him is searchable on Instagram. So if someone searches theme parks, 
he's coming up because it's in his name. So the same thing if they type social or social media, Katie's is gonna come up because the keywords are in her name. The same thing, real estate for her, that's pretty general. So like people who have like Florida real estate is gonna be way more specific, um, things like that. That is the only other searchable thing besides your actual Instagram handle on Instagram. So they don't care like what else is in your bio. So if you can put it in your actual name, you can search it. Um, what else? Well, like you'll see, they all have highlighted stories, which are these circles in the middle. So these are those 24 hour stories that they've saved permanently to live on their profile. So like Katie does a really good job because she has these like little cover pictures and makes it all the same. Um, and she literally has like, this is my Instagram tips. Here's my podcast. And she sorts her, some of her stories, not all of her stories, but some of her stories in those categories. The same thing, she has her currently active listings in a story. So um, those are options as well. And then the last thing I wanna point out is that in these first six photos for each of them, they all have reels. That's this little icon. So those videos are what's pushing in Instagram right now. And I know you guys hate it, but reels is where it's at, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and you'll see actually this one has 160K, they're all reels. She doesn't post a single normal picture anymore. All reels, videos, all the time. But that's, she's got a team. She's got a video team, right, to make her videos. So the more you can do reels, so you're walking through that new listing, take some video, set it to music. You know, those are going to help you get people's attention. Because Instagram, also Facebook, they're going the video route. So that's what we got to unfortunately play with. So if you're ready for it, try it out. I've been testing it too. I hate doing it. But the last thing I want to talk about, and then I want to give you guys the time to either ask questions or share some of what you think your own niche might be. But these are examples, and sorry for this bottom one getting covered on the screen here. Um, but these are examples of real estate niches. And you should pick one or two, and that's it. One or two, play to them all the time. It doesn't mean you're not going to get other things, but you should play to those um, niches as much as you can. So it could be by property type. So do you just want to sell, like play to that single family home or multifamily home? So you're going more for the investors, right? Um, condos specifically, there's actually a big niche just to do condos, which is interesting. Commercial, obviously historic homes. So like certain types of homes that way. You can go by specific types of buyers. So the first time home buyer, um, I especially suggest this if you have a lot of people in your sphere who are going to be first time home buyers. So kids, friends, all those things, like you can literally play to that. All your kids' friends are gonna get married and buy houses soon, right? So that might be a good niche for you to do. You can do luxury, um, again, investor buyers, commercial buyers, rent to own as well. And that's kind of an interesting um, diversity market to push to renters, but that you're gonna be teaching how to own. How can they grow their income? How can they develop themselves to be homeowners? So if you have diverse markets, Hispanic market, African-American market, Asian market, like those are big ones of like teaching them how, especially if they're new to the country, you know, people who move from other countries, teaching them how to rent to own. That could be an awesome niche. Specific types of sellers. Now, do you wanna be known as the, the divorce <laughs> real estate agent? <laughs> maybe not, but maybe you did get a divorce yourself and you can share your story and share how you've grown yourself. That might be an awesome thing to do actually, is to take your hardship and turn it into the positive and show other people they can do that too. So that's why I put it up there. So like, don't leave it off the table. Um, if you notice any of the best influencers, they have a sob story to start. And it's great. Lean into your sob story and show how you grew from it and show other people how they can do it too, right? That's essentially what influencers do. Um, marriages, so like I said, first time home buyers, 
or just people looking to buy that new house after their marriage, babies, so they're looking to expand after they've had babies. Um, so if you recently had a baby, those are things like, I need to get a bigger house, now I've had another kid. Um, retirement and downsizing. So if you're currently experiencing retiring and downsizing with your parents or um, things like that, you can share your journey and then attract more of those um, buyers and sellers that way. Investors, home flippers are always good seller options and then the FISBO as well. Um, but again, like you're going to focus on like one of these within the categories and run with it, right? We're getting super small. Situational, so like short sales, relocation, I put more like their job is forcing them to move, um, things like that. Um, green, um, eco-friendly housing, that's like a very specific niche, but like big, uh, which might be surprising, but it really is. Um, foreclosures, um, types of rental property. So I know not everyone wants to work with renters, but room rental, student housing. So if you had like a big college market, um, you could definitely teach people how to find better student housing than they would on campus. Um, full service apartments. So that's more luxury apartments, um, single family home rentals, things like that. Our communities, our gated communities, retirement communities, um, any sort of like specialty community. And then the exterior amenities, I did things like lakefront properties, um, farmhouses, um, what's around here. They also mentioned like ocean properties, but we don't have that. So, <laughs> but does anyone have any questions or like got any ideas from here? Because I think it would be good to share. Yeah. What links do you suggest putting on there? Like, in, should, like when you say the links, like I know right now I have the, like my real estate page, but I don't, it, that's not very interesting. Like, right, do you suggest like the Facebook page or what, what do you think? Yeah, I would do kind of like a, where else you can find me. Okay. Right. So you could share your Facebook business page, um, your actual website, because sometimes people are interested in exploring that. Um, you could do actually to your website to be like, search for homes here. Or literally the link to your KW app, like download my app here, right? Um, what else would be, if you have a YouTube channel or any other place that you're putting your content, a blog, um, those links can all go there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And frankly, if there's like a really cool article about you, like on a new website, like should link to that, like check me out in the Daily Herald. Yeah. So as far as like equipment to make you look good or better iPhone. or a highlight or like do you have like a list? Because I know that you know some people do have you know a microphone and then they have a light and mm -hmm. do you do you have a list? Like to be honest, iPhone that so. camera works great. Um, good lighting. Be outside. Right, you do not have to make this like super fancy to do well. Literally, I have a friend who only does selfie videos in her kitchen. I can't do that. I tried. <laughs> I, I tried to like put a little light on here, and then I was like, this. You don't even need the light. Go outside. Stand in the sun. Beautiful a light. A lot of people I see them do have like a ring light or a, a bigger. Right. And I would say a ring light's great if you're not going to move. If you're going to set it up and you're going to do your static shot, a ring light. But if you don't have a ring light, like get a lamp that can like can tilt the shape. There you go. Like I really wouldn't worry about how hot like a video quality you have when you start. It's going to be about how often your consistency how much are you showing up? Are you responding to comments on your videos? Okay. That's what's going to generate interest. And you can get a video team eventually. You know? <laughs> how successful can you be on Instagram without everyday stories? Um, I would say stories are where it's at. So I wouldn't do everyday posts. I would do everyday stories. Um, you can be successful without the stories, but like I said, Instagram's kind of going for that video side of things. So, so the comment that it's allowed us to post to Instagram and Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. When we do the ads, 
thought it's better to choose the stories then. I would say so. So it's going to run in that story for the period of a week, as much as you pay every day. How does right. it work? Because I know if I'm paying for those ads, they don't really show up on my Facebook account. They're hidden, right? So I understand that the same thing would be happening with Instagram. Right. But they're in their stores. So other people right. see our story, but we cannot. Well, with paid ads, it's served to the people you're targeting. So you don't want yourself to be in your target market, right? I don't want to see my own ads. But that's me wasting there is money. somebody looking at my account and looking through my stories, should they be able to see that story? They can't see the ad. So again, the ad is being served to your target. But what you can do is, you know, make a duplicate, like, and just post it to your stories. But that would be separate. So the paid ad, you're paying to get it served to the right people. You know, for me, it's just like so much work. We are so crazy busy every day. And then keep in mind that we still have to post every day to those stories. It's like, you know, I know you, probably my daughters, like so easy for them. But for me, like sometimes I'm just like, I don't really have time. So if that ad that's showing for Facebook supplement will be able to show in the period of week, in our Insta story. It will show in the stories when people watch them. It just won't be on your personal profile and that's fine, but you're not going to get followers, right? The ad, the purpose is they click the ad, they give you their information and they're elite. The stories is I'm gonna attract followers, more followers to my page. So it's okay not to pursue followers, right? You don't right. have to post in your stories to pursue followers if you're gonna go the ad route, right? Um, I think stories and growing the Instagram accounts are more for people who don't want to spend money. Right. But so, so if I'm understanding this correctly, from command, we can also post our, <laughs> to our so Instagram story and we can schedule that, right? Yes. Okay. So that's the biggest thing. And I know it's a lot of time. I mean, I have three jobs and I post 10 times a day on my stories because I know that's where my business is coming from, right? So I will do the hard work to get my business. I don't wanna to post to my stories every day. In fact, I feel ugly and I take selfies. Like, you know, cause it's, I wake up first thing in the morning and the best thing to do is post a selfie of yourself with a poll. And that's why you see my dumb polls. It's like, are you ready for Christmas? Yes or no. But like, <laughs> what that does is for people who click, they engage. And they're more likely to see my next story, right? And my next story is going to be, look at this client I helped, right? And now they're coming back. So I understand completely. So I have two accounts on, on Instagram. One is like literally like work related, right? And mm -hmm. the other one is more personal. So the stories that I'm putting on my professional Instagram everyday life, like, like, yeah, sure. I would like, I don't even use a personal Instagram. My business is me. Yeah, and I think for realtors, that's the same, right? Like you, they want to work with you. They don't want to work with Keller Williams as this office, right? So I want to see as much. Now you don't have to share um, going out with your friends there and drinking too much, right? Because it's your <laughs> professional account. But do share that cup of coffee you spilled in the morning, right? Like, oh my gosh, my morning is starting out like this. And everyone's gonna be like, I feel you, right? <laughs> and they're gonna connect with you that way. It's the same thing, share your kids hockey game, right? Like they're gonna connect with you because of that. And then you're not just a business entity, you're someone they're like, I could be friends with that person. And that's awesome. How uh, long, like how much fun they can see our stories? 24 hours and then they disappear, yeah. Unless you save them permanently to that section of your profile. So what's a different, I, I see the stories, but how are this, like the posts you get in your newsfeed, but some posts or some stories you get in the feed, but how is that different? Yeah, so the posts just appear automatically. So if I open Instagram, it's just showing me posts I can scroll, right? <laughs> stories, I have to actively choose that I wanna go look at people's stories. And that's why I like them because um, essentially, they are choosing to view my content. It's not just getting served to them. They're like, oh, like, and move on, right? They, they're choosing to be there and look at people's stories. 
It's not just something that opens. So that's why it's valuable. They do disappear. And so that's why I say to post three to 10 times a day throughout the day. So one in the morning, once in the afternoon, once at night, because you're going to keep popping up at the top of their feed, right? When they open Instagram, it's like, I was there in the morning. Now I'm back in the afternoon. And in fact, some of you have been like, Colleen, you're always the first thing I see. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, but that's what I do is I literally just jump back into your world right throughout the day. And sometimes it's dumb and sometimes it's my business, right? So the posts are going to be there permanently, but Instagram serving it to people. So they're not necessarily as engaged, like, oh, I want to read her whole description. Like how often do you read someone's whole description on Instagram? Yeah. Donna, I think you're I'm kind of insta ignorant because I'm old. That's so okay. I'm, but I'm trying because it's I don't okay. know the there. So I guess how do you? I have about four people following me, maybe, maybe twenty. You know, but how do you transfer over and grab people that aren't following you? Like hashtags. Like I mean, how how is, what's the best way to grab people and take them to you? Yeah. Instead of just having the twenty people following you watch your video and they don't really care. Yeah. So that's going to be well. Half the people mentioned hashtags mm -hmm. and your niche hashtags. So the things people are worried about, things they're scared about, or the things they're just interested in seeing, right? If um, I know I recently started doing like travel photography hashtags with a few of my like travel posts because people are like looking for like Colorado like places to go. And if I tag Colorado, like they might see that there. Um, so I've seen some growth from hashtags. And so that's why you do want to use them but not too many, just like use um, niche type ones. Like, so you don't wanna do hashtag realtor, right? Like that's not gonna help you, you're gonna get lost <laughs> in a world of realtors, right? But if you are like Illinois retirement specialist, right? Like you're gonna get people who are searching for like retirement help, right? Normally. And then that's the other side where reels are doing well is if someone sees your reel and it's teaching them something, they'll normally come and follow. So I've been getting lots of followers from reels and hashtags. But the reels you hashtag with whatever the reel is about, right? Right. Is what you're saying. Yeah. So that way I'm like teaching them. Um, typically those are the ones that do well or that are funny. <laughs> like those just blow up sometimes. Yeah. Other questions? How are we on time? Three minutes. What is too many hashtags? Well, you can only have 30. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, so you're limited to 30. Um, but what I find is people are like, which ones do I do? And trying to type 30, you'll be like, okay, Realtor Illinois. Like you just throw some extra ones in and like those aren't helping you. So just ignore them. Like focus in and pick your 10. Give yourself a personal hashtag. Like I use my name or um, like my Instagram handle, um, things like that. So that people, if they search that, they would just see all my posts because no one else is using it <laughs> and things like that. So. Fantastic. Are we still live? We are still live. I was going to get this. All right. Well. We have a treat for you, uh, as if this wasn't fantastic enough and the rest of the day hasn't been amazing. Another titan of business is on his way. Rich, come on down and join us. Rich Tepper, uh, one of our top agents, is going to share with you some lead generation techniques, uh, some insight on how he's built his empire. Rich, I'm excited. Do you want to sit, stand? We'll just Standing do. is good. Yeah, perfect. All right, take it away. Okay. Oh. So they told me to talk about lead generation. Uh, I guess the first question is, you know, it's two words, lead and gen, generation, right? So so what is a lead? I mean, can we talk about that a little bit? I mean, is a lead just a phone number in your database, or is it someone who wants to buy a house tomorrow, or is it something in between, right? So we have different kinds of leads, you know, we have the... Uh, you know, the high quality leads that are connected, as we talked earlier, about people that have a relationship with you, people that would do business only with you. And then we've got the lead that's just, say, a Facebook lead that's just out there that doesn't know you from anybody. So I guess the question is, what, 
what do you need to do for each person and, and how do you handle it differently, right? So I guess that's the question. So um, I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, we've got like lead aggregators like Zillow and Realtor.com. You can buy leads. You can buy leads on a, on a referral basis. You can buy leads on a pay per click basis. You know, there's different ways you can buy leads. So, you know, I guess the question is what, how does it work for you? You know, so, you know, so the lead is say hot, you know, are they zero to 30, zero to 60, zero to 90 days out, three to six months, six to 12 months or longer. Um, and then what's their motivation? You know, so do we know all of these different pieces to the process? Um, what is their financial ability to purchase and how soon do we need to know that uh, in the process before we engage the lead? Um, and do they have realistic expectations? Are they looking for a needle in the haystack? Or are they willing to buy the three bedroom, two bath house that needs a little, little polish to make it work, but it's realistic only in the price range and they'll buy it, right? Um, or are they such a stickler for exact that if the last bedroom is one foot too short, they're not buying, it, right? So you've got all kinds of different categories on that. Um, and are they most likely to do business with you versus someone else, right? So, so this is basically what a lead is, and then, and then. Once you know that, then it's about what you're going to do to generate a lead, right? So where does your lead come from? So where are you guys getting leads from now? What, what's your most common source? Not Zillow. Referrals. <laughs> referrals? Okay. So I read somewhere that 84% of all business is done by referral. I think Brian Buffini probably came up with that one. But, uh, <laughs> but it is true. I mean, most of us are doing business with people that know us, like us, and trust us. So... You know, in the big scheme of things, you know, how do we how do we pro approach each one? So I think what it comes down to is, you know, are you looking to generate a lead today that's going to do business today? Like if you picked up the phone and said, will you buy a house for me today? Will you sign a contract? Right. You might. You might not. But, you know, how do you how do you get to that point where someone's ready? And I think it was um, alluded to earlier is that there's a process that takes, um, I think, Haley had said it, you know, 17 to 24 months for an internet lead or, you know, and then if you go to like a Zillow lead, the, the, the funnel time is a little shorter. So you have that. And then you got the ones like Scott was talking about earlier is they call you up and say, I need to sell my house and I need to be in, I need to be in Tennessee in three weeks. So <laughs> you like to get those calls, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's, you know, the difference between the leads. So, so, so once you know their motivation, you know, their timing, you have an understanding of your relationship, however strong or weak that might be at that moment. Now you have a concept of what the lead might be all about and how you can best help them. And this comes back to what Don was talking about earlier is asking lots of questions. You know, why are they moving? Why is that important to them? Um, I'm gonna tell you a quick story about a motivation situation. So in 2007, I listed a house for 289 we got an offer on it for 260 and we came back to negotiations and we got the offer up to 280 and the seller said we want 284 and the buyer said no and they walked okay that was in 2007 right before the market crash three years later i got a phone call from that same client who said rich we want to sell our house and i said you know the market's changed a lot and they said well we know we understand that I said, well, your house today is worth about 210, right? And they said, well, we still want to move. And I said, well, tell me what changed between 2007 and 2010. And the story was this. In 2007, the lady's mother was in Woodstock in a nursing home. The kids and uh, the grandkids were living in Bartlett and everybody was close. And um, in 2010, the mother had passed away and the kids and grandkids moved to West Virginia and there was nothing keeping them here. And they wanted to not miss the time with those grandkids because they were like seven or eight years old. And so they were really wanting that time. So that gets back to that motivation factor is, is uh, that's the quality of that lead. And we sold it, we sold it for 210 for them. And so fairly quickly, but that's how much the market changed. So um, I know Gary Keller talks about leads and he defines them in two different categories. We have the Mets, and they have not met. So how many of you haven't heard this like a thousand times, right? Okay, so obviously in, in the, the early hours of the morning as I was contemplating what to talk to you guys about, it occurred to me that 
And I kept trying to say, well, what does everybody want to hear? What do they need? And it really occurred to me that most of what we're really going to be talking about ideally is our Mets. And I'm going to talk about you that for a very specific reason. When you get into the Mets, um, everything is relational versus transaction, right? You know the people in your Met database. We've kind of beat this one to death, but you know, Scott talked about reading them how many 48 times, 100 times? What did you say, Scott? So we need to reach people frequently. We need to be connecting with them at their level, whatever is happening in their life. Um, and the average person in your database now is going to move probably every 10 years. So if you've got 500 people, for example, in your database, you've got 50 opportunities this year just from that database. Now, how many of those are you going to get? It depends how close are you connected to them. Um, did their sister just get her license last week, right? Um, so, you know, lots of things that could cause that not to happen. But by the same token, if you're there, you're likely to get a better shot at those 50 deals than anybody else. Does that make sense? So that's really the concept of generating a lead is just, in my mind, after having done this for over 30 years and having worked the hard leads and having spent a lot of money on the hard leads, if you can build a business around your database and just stay on top of it, that's really the huge win for leads. Um, they cost a lot less. Um, I just got back from a seminar where I met with a team that has almost 90 people on the team. Yeah, and in the last, uh, in two months of last fall, that team actually lost money. This is a team that's doing about $9 million in gross commissions, okay? Huge team. Um, and this year, they're going to probably average 19% return on investment for what they make. So, you know, that's a really small number. Gary Keller talks about 30% or teams, um, some of the more efficient teams can run at 50 or 60%. If you're a solo agent and you're doing a pretty good volume, you could be taking home you know, 80 to 90% of the money. And that's a pretty big number. So if you can stay efficient with your, your systems and your communications, you can keep your margins higher. <laughs> it's a huge win. You know, I mean, there's nothing great about having a $100 million volume if you're only bringing home as much as the guy who's doing 20 million, for example, right? Or less, which I've seen that happen a lot. So it's kind of scary when you think about it, that that can happen, but it kind of gets away from you. I remember in 2019, I went to New Orleans. That was before I got here, actually. I was invited to Keller Williams as a guest and went there and the guy got up on stage and Gary brought him up for the specific purpose of talking about profitability. And in that talk, he said, last year we did $80 million in volume and we lost money, <laughs> not even make money. So, so when you look at the cost of lead generation and the time involved and okay, somebody calls you off of Facebook and I'm just browsing, right? I mean, how much time do you wanna put into that lead? I'm not saying you shouldn't work those leads, but are they really your highest and best source of your time and effort are, are you better off taking a client to lunch? I mean, I've got several clients that the entire family has done business with me. They've referred all their friends and family. And we've done eight or 10 or 15 transactions from one start of one transaction. And those people are certainly worth your time and your energy and a little bit of your money. Uh, maybe take the whole family out to dinner or something like that, you know, where you really do something special for somebody. But that's, I think, you know, so it's a much better place to spend your money than to drop three to five hundred to a thousand dollars a month or more on marketing to people that you don't know that don't, that don't have a relationship or connection with you. So uh, this is me struggling this morning. I woke up at four thirty to write this, and I thought, gosh, where do I want to go with this? So I hope this. Um, I, I kind of want to interact with you guys and, and share with me your thoughts on this and tell me what you're thinking. Hey, Rich, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, when you're interacting with your database, the taking them out to lunch, right, is one iteration of that. I think where some people might struggle is how to the up value of people in their database without being sales. I'm glad you mentioned that. I did write that at 545 this morning, so I have that here too. So in that situation, um, for example, when the market really got slow and prices were dropping, 
Oh, I did one year over a hundred property tax appeals. I made thirty-five thousand dollars doing tax appeals when there was no money to be made doing anything else. Um, but I offered it as a service, and I now offer it just to let people know it's available so they know they can do it. There's very few anymore that we can get done because the price has gone up so much. But every now and then we'll get somebody who needs a tax appeal. Um, how about saving someone um, who you uh, sold a house to last year with a 3% mortgage, but the rates, the interest, the value has gone up so far that if they refinance, they're now at 80% LTV and they can take $180 a month off their payment because they can remove the PMI. Okay, that's an added value idea, Dan. Um, how about um, just helping them with a the refinance in case their rate was higher? We've had people save $300 a month on a payment because they refinance from four and a quarter to, to three. So these are some simple things. And you can find out, if you don't remember, on Remind, what their interest rate is. You can go in the computer and it'll tell you that they got a 4.75 rate. And then you can help them save some money that way. So lots of things like that. How about being of service and value to someone with uh, painters, plumbers, contractors, things like that. Just little details like that. How about helping someone with... Uh, Investment ideas. You know, what are you guys doing for investment? How much money are you earning in the bank on your interest? Like 0.02% or something like that, right? So what if you took that money and you put it into an investment, a piece of real estate, you could earn six or eight or nine percent return on your money uh, or better. And so different ways like that. So we have something that we uh, we uh, talk to people about if they've got little kids. Um, so they want to take their kids and send them to college. They want to start up a college fund. So, you know, you've guys heard of the 529 plan. Mm -hmm. So for my son, we had the 1039 plan. That was 1039 plum tree in Crystal Lake. Um, <laughs> and that's, that was what we decided that would be the money we would use to pay for his college. All we had to do was buy the house and then let the tenant pay the mortgage for us. And that's how we worked that up. So you can use that same type of value add for people as well. Rich, I got another one. Uh, are you using any uh, for the people that you're spending quality time with and not just touching digitally, right? So the ones that you're taking out to lunch, do you have any like metrics that you are following to determine who those people are in your world when you take so take a client out to lunch, right? Have they done X number of deals with you? Is there like a price point they hit? Are you doing this for everybody? Like what sort of personal metrics are you using? I don't really have a specific metric for that. I would say that, you know, just knowing you know, I've got a handful of families that I know are the big players for me. They're real advocates. But then there's other people like like Susan Martino. I mean, she's probably sent a half a dozen people to me, you know, and her daughter and son-in-law sold their house for me. And when I call her, she goes, I just talked to so-and-so about you last week. You know, every phone call I make with her is like that. Um, those are your advocates. And we got to treat those people really well. So, you know, a little nicer Christmas card or something more personal or a a little gift in the mail or a gift card, you know, to Panera or, you know, Starbucks or something like that. Just a little gimme or something. Like that. One time I had a client who um, I used to send out the birthday cards every year. And I even used to do them for all the kids, which I don't do that anymore. But I did. And this girl's um, 16th birthday had come up and I missed the birthday card. And her dad was an insurance agent. And she said, you know, my daughter missed your birthday card. Um, so I, I sent her a dozen roses. Aww. Yeah, and that and they never forgot it. <laughs> so those are little kind of extras I would say you can do for people. But think of all the money we waste on cold beats and all the time and energy and systems we create just to do cold beats. And so I, I mean I could have talked about all that, and I said, well, this is where the heart of it is. This is where everything happens right here. So if you don't have a database, you need to start one. Uh, if you do have a database, you need to nurture it and love on it and treat it well and have systems in place, automated, um, you know, automated phone calls four times a year. Uh, we send out the birthday cards. We have the home anniversary cards that go out. Well, we do um, twice a month, we sent them an automated electronic email. We use a company called Outbound Engine and we use that and people love it. I just got, in fact, while I'm sitting here, I got an email from one, and unfortunately, uh, my, my client uh, 
her husband had just passed away. So she said, I got your birthday, your Christmas message. Unfortunately, um, you know, David passed away. Can you give me a call? You know, but that was just a connection just from being there twice a month. Plus we do the same thing with Facebook. This particular company helps me with that. So the messages go out on Facebook. I mean, none of this is earth shatteringly difficult, right? It's just part of the process. But I would say the phone calls are by far the most important thing you can do. Staying personally in touch. You know, one guy, you know, he had some health problems. So next time I called him, first thing I said was, you know, and he wants to sell his house, but we can talk about that. We talked about, you know, he had this heart condition thing. How's it going? What's happening? What's it feel like? We all have to connect at a deeper level with that. So I would say those are the main the main pieces. But, you know, from a value perspective, like I said, um, estate planning, retirement planning, you know, should their house be in a trust? You know, should they be talking to an attorney about that? These kinds of details are extra things that we can bring to the table. So, so Rich, what I'm hearing is that you're leveraging systems to help you stay here. Yes, yeah, systems, people, and technology. So every day my assistant, Nikki, goes in the computer and it tells her whose birthday is up and whose home anniversary is up. She fills out the card. If it's the home anniversary, she writes a little number in the upper corner where the stamp goes. So if it's the sixth anniversary, I'll say, hey, Bob and Susan, congratulations on six years in your home. Hope things are going great. If there's anything else I can do for you, let me know. By the way, have a Merry Christmas. Da -da -da. And then we also put a little note in the side, which says, you know, if you're interested in knowing more about your home's value, it's a pre-printed note. Um, we'd be happy to give you an update on that. There's no charge as part of our service process. And we would include these in the home anniversary cards. And the goal is just to get them to reconnect at a different level. Something was said earlier too about, about whether or not somebody's actually calling you back. So I had something happen this year that was interesting. Past client of mine, called them four times a year, sent them the cards, nothing, ghosted me, right? Still kept leaving the messages. They called me up one day and said, hey, Rich, we're ready to sell our house. They never said, hey, sorry, I never called you back. I've been a real jerk. I didn't get any of that, right? <laughs> just let's sell our house. So they were getting the message. They just weren't ready to communicate. So we got to think sometimes that's okay. How many times do you think you, you might have covered this when I was out How many times do you think you're interacting with you? one single person in your database in the course of a year? Well, four phone calls, probably two or three letters, uh, 24 emails. And then if they're on Facebook, that would be more. Yeah. So at a minimum, they would be 30, 35 contacts probably. I think we've heard that. Yeah. Somewhere in that range. Something like that. Rich, you have a lot of this down to like a system to where maybe your assistant's doing some stuff, automated stuff is happening. Do you have like a dedicated time to lead generate? And if so, like how often is that? Um, I'm a, I don't uh, take any appointments in the morning. I do all my calls in the morning. Uh, depending on what time I get up, usually between 8 and 9, I'm in the office until about 11. And um, if you let something interrupt your call time, that's where you're going to make problems. There's always something that will get in the way. So you do not take calls at all. Or any interruptions during your call time. And you probably should be able to reach about six people an hour on average, You're having a few quality conversations. Now I will tell you, you know, it's easy to get caught up in conversations and you look at the clock on the phone and my phone tells me, Rich, you're at 24 minutes, you know, well, it's time to get off the phone. Find a find a way out. You know, you gotta you gotta move on to the next thing. You can't you can't spend more than a few minutes on most phone calls. Who feels the fact right now? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah so so yeah so the system tells me when to call and who to call um and so i guys look at my task list every day and it's an automated process which you can do through command or any crm rich is your office in-house like in your house actually or? no i have 925 square feet in an office building in crystal lake and there's six of us there could you do the same amount of work if you were in home or no if you're small I don't, I don't think it would be a problem. School. I just don't prefer to work from home. Oh. We did that for a little while. Um, and, uh, this is much better. Yeah. Do you use a, uh, an auto dialer? Or? I do have a dialer. It's built into the CRM that I use. What CRM do you use? I use something called Follow-Up Boss. Yeah. 
And so that works really well. I think I like the dialer function. Never have to touch a phone number. The other thing that's nice is that it, it, whatever CRM you use, you have to make sure that everything goes into the into the space. You know, your texts, your phone calls, your emails. Keep everything in one spot if you can. It's helpful. I think Command does that, right? So it, it's a good it's a good program for that purpose. So. Do you have a separate um, website on your own? I use a website through a company called White Local. Okay. Rich, what's your blood type? <laughs> Yeah, well, that was good. So, I don't know about you guys, but the thing that I keep hearing, especially uh, if you look at this this event today, or, I mean, you asked five questions, I kept track, right. And so even somebody at the top of their game is coming from a learning-based mindset and an abundance-based environment where they'll share their methods with you. That is the quality of having people in person in an environment like KW. Uh, also, the thing I kept hearing about you guys is that the fundamental tools just work. I can't tell you how many, uh, now Rich is like your systems master, but there are a lot of other big agents that just use spreadsheets. And so like, what's the best CRM? The one that works, the one that you use. Awesome. Round of applause for Rich. <laughs> All right, for those of you on the stream, this is where we say goodbye. The rest of us are going to go party. We're going to make some pot pies. We're going to eat some of that candy. And uh, if you're feeling like, man, I missed out. You did. Yep, you you did. did. And we'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>